Thank you for coming to learn with me to School of Mitzvot. Baruch Hashem. We have our uh, new week. Baruch Hashem. Shavua Tov. Shavua Mevorach. Uh, new week. We're going to start with our uh, Bitachon series. Maybe we'll open up to uh, some questions somewhere in the middle. I'm sure you guys are, uh, have a few questions that uh, can't wait for Wednesday. So Bezot Hashem, uh, if something is pressing, you could ask. Um, Bezot Hashem, today's shiur will uh, also be for uh, Ilui Nishmat uh, David Davidovit, uh, also uh, Israel Isaac Ben Menachem, and um, also a refuah uh, shlema for Ram Gobin Dunarin Ben uh, Beniram, son of Dopla Dopalri, and also for Atzlachar Abba for Cassandra Lacombe and her husband and her family. Bezot Hashem, Kadosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam. Also, refuah shlema, refuah the nefesh, refuah the guf for Levana Bat Sara, Sara Bat Levana, uh, David Ben Nesria, Doris Bat Jora, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit uh, Sara Bat Anat, and all of Am Israel will have refuah shlema, refuah the nefesh, refuah the guf. Uh, tonight we're going to continue our series of Pitachon. We're up to uh, number 14 in the series. Uh, Be'ezot Hashem, uh, we'll go over a few things, but this is one of those uh, topics that you could study Bitachon every day for a year straight and you still need more. You could study it for 10 years straight and you still need more. Come, come. You had a good picture last week, so they, the, the fans like you. So uh, you can study Bitachon every day of your life, but you still need more. Why? Bitachon is literally means confidence. But what's confidence in what? What confidence in yourself? Many people have confidence in themselves and they still fall flat on their face. Sometimes people have overconfidence in themselves and they fall on their face. So what's confidence? What does it mean confidence? It's good to have confidence in yourself if that confidence is rooted from something where you know that no matter what, whether it's good or bad, it comes from Hashem. That's a healthy level of confidence. But if you have the type of which is pretty much having confidence in your own abilities, then unfortunately that confidence could be rooted from a very, very bad place called arrogance. And as we talked about last week, HaKadosh Baruch Hu despises arrogance, despises people that have arrogance. Why? The Ramban says, being arrogant, being overly confident, thinking who you are. Not because it's Hashem, because you think that you're strong, you think that you're this, you think that you're that. Thinking that way, it's like stealing the king's robe and acting like you're the king. It's a joke. It's a joke. Why? You're not the king, you just stole his robe. Meaning that if a person has confidence because of their own abilities, if you will, then in reality, they take everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them, and they forgot that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave them. And they're using it as if they got it themselves. They forgot that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that gave them the brain, even though the brain had the idea, where did you get the brain from? Would the brain function without Hashem deciding? If they lifted a certain amount of weights, when I was a kid, 17, 18 years old, they used to lift a lot of weights. And I thought it was me. I mean, I, I understood Hashem runs the world, but I thought I was the one lifting the 805 pounds on top of my back and squatting it. I thought it was me. Little did I know that eight years later, I was barely going to be able to lift myself because of all the surgeries that I had, Baruch Hashem. But I wanted 18. Young and healthy, would squat more weight than probably four or five of you together. Thought it was me. Hashem showed me, no, it's not you. Why? I could take it away just like that. So when a person has confidence in himself because of himself, the root of it is evil. The root of it is bad. When a person thinks, oh, I'm going to get a job because I have a certain IQ or a certain amount of knowledge, and they forgot that that knowledge and that IQ and that brain, and even the idea itself is all gifted to you from Hashem, you forgot it, then unfortunately, that's a 
confidence that's coming from the wrong place. But it is very, very important to have confidence. It is very important to know that you can technically do anything you put your mind to, but you have to ask for Hashem's help. Because in reality, He's going to help you with or without your uh, request, but if you ask for His help, it's in essence as if you're recognizing that it's really coming from Him. Now the question is, when it comes to confidence in Hashem, when do you start praying to Hashem? When you pray, most people, most people, they pray to Hashem when all hell breaks loose, when everything goes wrong. That's when everybody becomes tzaddik. Everybody becomes religious at the morgue. Everybody becomes religious when everybody, you know, things are going bad. Keep every day. Before, he wouldn't even want to wear a keeper inside Shil Torah. But after he lost all of his money, he wears a keeper every day. The wife doesn't want, he told him, oh honey, listen, here's the divorce papers. All of a sudden, he's like, no, no, maybe we should go learn about Shlom Bayit. Well, why didn't you learn before we, I wanted to divorce you? Everybody wants to do tshuva after the fact. The question is, are we right to pray to Hashem after things go bad, or should we pray before? <coughs> now the Gemara says, a smart person, meaning smart, meaning someone that has Torah, is very different from a foolish person, meaning a person who does not have Torah. Why? Because the guy that does not have Torah, he could be a mandis, an engineer. He could be uh, building rocket ships. He could be a genius when it comes to math, when it comes to science, when it comes to history, when it comes to knowing all the stats for every basketball, football, and baseball player that ever lived, and their salary caps. He can all that stuff. But the Torah still calls him a fool. Why? He doesn't know Torah. If you don't have Torah, Hashem says, oh yes, my, one of my foolish kids. Why? He doesn't know anything. Yeah, but he knows all the stats. He knows how much LeBron James is going to make next week. He knows how tall LeBron James' son is. He knows how, 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 how big his cousin is that's going to join the NBA. He knows his mother's cousin's side. He knows everything about all his family. Yeah, but once he dies, he's going to go up to Shemaim. They're going to ask him, okay, so what do you do in the world? Oh, I know LeBron James. Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, LeBron James is in a different department. He's not going to help you here. He's not going to help you here. What else do you know? Do you know any Torah? Do you know anything of significance? If his answer is no, he's going to be considered a fool. But a fool in front of millions and millions of neshamot that are watching it. Because the answers to life can only come from the Torah. Now, a person that does have, doesn't have the wisdom of Torah, he's going to pray to Hashem after the fact. She's going to pray to Hashem after her husband tells her, Honey, I don't want to be married to you anymore. That's when she starts praying to Hashem. She's going to start praying to Hashem once the doctor says, I'm sorry ma'am, you can't have kids. Then she's going to start praying to Hashem. He's going to start praying to Hashem when the boss says, Listen, thank you very much for working for us for the last 10 years. We appreciate your contribution to the company, but you're fired. Then he's going to start praying to Hashem. That's a fool. That's a fool. Why? It's too late. All of you know this. It's too late. She wants to divorce him. She can't have kids. He got fired. It's too late. A wise person, meaning a person that has Torah, knows that it's important for him to pray before the problem. During the problem and after the problem. Meaning every single day, a kosher Jew wakes up with praying. First thing in the morning, a Jew says, Thank you, Akados Bauchu, for bringing back my neshama into my body because you have emunah, you have belief in me that today I'm going to serve you better. Already you start your day with, Thank you, Hashem, I know everything is from you, including my own neshama. And then you go on into your day, and you start doing it till at your dime, and you do a prayer, and you go to the bathroom, and after you finish relieving yourself, you do another prayer. Thank you, Hashem, for making my body work. Because if it didn't work for even a moment, ooh, wow, how much pain that is. Anybody that's ever been constipated for half an hour knows how painful it is. Imagine being constipated for two, for two three days. Imagine not being constipated. Imagine going too much. Imagine it hurts every time you go, but you have to go. A person that never experienced such pains is hard for him to relate to this pain, but I promise you, you don't want it. So it's very, very smart for every person to thank Hashem for just doing simple things. Simple things 
like going to the bathroom. Then he prays to Hashem, puts on tefillin, she prays to Hashem, she does Kriyat Shema, thank you Hashem for making me a Jew, thank you Hashem for putting me in this world, thank you Hashem for all the difficulties, because I know these difficulties are supposed to build me, and so on and so forth. We thank Hashem for everything, but most importantly we recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one that gave us the problem, but also is going to give us the solution. A kosher Jew is going to pray to Hashem before, during, and after the problem. But sometimes we forget this. Sometimes we forget it. The Lubavitch Rebbe, Allah Shalom, his yard site was just, I believe, yesterday. And it was a fantastic story that I heard about him from my Rebbe today that gives us a little bit of perspective of when you're supposed to pray. One Chabadni comes to the Rebbe many years ago and he says, Kvod Arav, listen, they're having a big kinnis, a big, uh, you know, uh, speech of all these big rabbis and from all over the world, they're bringing people from, the, from Europe, from this, from that. And for America, they invited me. I'm not at the level of these big rabbis, but they invited me to speak. And they not only invited me, they invited me to speak as the main keynote speaker after the biggest rabbi in the world. So the Babichir Rabbi says to him, Chazakudor, good for you. He goes, uh, I don't know what to say. What am I going to say in front of all these big rabbis? He says, this is what you say. And he starts, tells him, listen, the Rambam says Allah X, Y, Z. But the Rambam himself, in a different book, he contradicts himself. But this is why. And he starts explaining to him the whole journey from how the Rambam got from here to the other one and then he mentions all of the other Chachamim that have mentioned this Alakha literally gives him the lecture from A to Z. The guy is so happy, I just got a speech from the Lubavitch Rebbe, Ishtabach Shimo, wow! Ezi Yofi, imagine you have a speech from one of the biggest rabbis in the world, it can't go wrong. So he goes to the Kenes, he goes to this big event Hundreds and hundreds of people, big rabbis, small rabbis, middle rabbis, all types of rabbis are there. Now they invite the main speaker, the, and he starts talking. And the Shabadnik, his, whole, his eyes grew dark. Why? Everything he's saying is written in his paper. But your rabbi gave him the lecture also, like a copy. Everything he's saying, he's saying. And he said, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. What am I going to say to these people? He said, Mama's word for word. Word for word, he said, do, 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 Everything. And the guy, Miskin, the poor guy, is eating his heart out. He doesn't know what to say. What am I going to say? Thousands of people are here. I'm going to embarrass myself. I'm sorry, Rabotai. I have nothing to say. Because you can't just tell them, listen, guys, you know, you should have emunah in Hashem, and you should tell your, 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 your keilah to keep Shabbat. These are rabbis. You have to give them something special. He doesn't know what to say. And he hears this, the big rabbi saying everything word for word, but then he stops in the middle. And he says, I'm sorry, I can't continue. I don't feel well. Please. I really apologize, everyone. I have to sit down. So the, the MC comes up. He goes, hey, Rabotai, I'm sorry, the rabbi can't continue anymore, but we'll have our next speaker come up and speak for us. The Chabadni comes up, and it couldn't be better. It couldn't be better. Why? Everybody is saying, wow, we had such a great speech. We're left in the middle, like at the climatic event. Right at the most highlight event, it stopped. He couldn't speak anymore. And like, wow, we really want to know the answer. I wish we knew the answer. Then this guy says the rest of the speech. And everybody's like, wow, what a genius. Without preparation, he already knew what he's going to bring. And he finished the whole equation. Wow, they praised him. They recommended him. He became the most famous rabbi. So then the rabbi actually said that they had the speech. He told a story, and uh, I believe in Israel, just this uh, maybe last few days. And my Rebbe heard it, and he says, whether the Lubavitcher Rebbe had Ruach HaKodesh that he knew this is going to happen or not, that's not my business. I don't know. All I know is that the darkness that I felt when he said everything that I was supposed to say 
was a feeling I never wanted before. But Hashem also showed me that right before the biggest salvation in my life also came the biggest darkness. Right before the Yeshuat Hashem, right before the greatest thing that I've ever experienced in my life was also something that felt momentarily like the biggest embarrassment was about to happen. This Rabotai is the reason why a Jew is supposed to pray before the problem, during the problem, and after the problem. Now, our Chachamim have taught us that if you want to have bitachon, it's one of those things that you have to work on every single day, ultimately arriving at a conclusion that everything and anything that's happening in your life is an opportunity to build yourself higher, to build yourself closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, the Beta Levi says, turn to Hashem and ask Him before you start exerting yourself. Whenever anyone is suffering or lacks whatever he needs, instead of saying, you know what, let me try harder. You know, you're working, you're working, you're working, and Parnassah is not coming. You're working, you're working, you're working, and you still fail the test. You're working, you're working, you're working, the car still won't turn on. You know, sometimes you work on the car, not that I me, mean, I never worked on cars, I don't know anything about cars, but I'm pretending like I knew from the story. And sometimes you work on cars, you work for five hours, you turn it on, it doesn't turn on. So the Beit Levi says, before you do more, before you say, you know what, instead of working five days a week, maybe I'll work six days a week. Instead of working eight hours a day, maybe I'll work 12 hours a day. Instead of doing this, I'll do more before you do that. First, examine your own deeds. Examine your own life. Take a few moments. Stop. Stop whatever it is that you're doing. And start reflecting on your life. And say, why is a Kadosh Baruch Hu my Father in Heaven, that loves me, that adores me, that created me for my own benefit, why is He causing me this suffering? What does He get out of it? What does He get out of me having this pain that I have, this emotional pain, this physical pain, this psychological pain? What does He get out of it? Now if your answer is, oh, maybe He likes it, then you believe in the wrong God. But the reality is you have to start examining why is my wife yelling at me right now? That means that Hashem signed off in Bet of Shamayim. He said, wife is going to yell at Yaron today. Why? Maybe Yaron did something wrong. Maybe Yaron did something wrong. No, 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 she's wrong. She's a Shah. She's like the set. No, no, no. You, you, you. First and foremost, look at the person you see in the mirror first. Sometimes people look at the mirror, but they see what's behind you. You have to look at the mirror first. You. What did you do wrong? That's what the Beit Levi says. And he should try to find everything that he did that's not proper. Because they could have been the reasons that caused them the problem. As it says in the Gemara Masechet Brachot, page 5, if one sees that he has afflictions coming upon him, he should examine his deeds, do tshuva, meaning repent from his bad ways, Pour out his heart before Hashem so that his afflictions will go away. This sounds simple, and technically it is, if we already have gotten ourselves used to looking at ourselves first. If you see that you don't have shlom bait, you don't have peace in the house, you only have one person to blame you. If you see you have no money, you have money problems, you only have one person to blame. Don't blame your boss. Don't blame the economy. Don't blame the stock market. Don't blame the president. Don't blame the whoever. You. You are at fault for everything. That's rule number one. Now you can go and blame the president. You can blame the stock market. You can blame me if you want. That's not going to help you. What's going to help you is if you blame yourself. Why? Okay, what am I doing? I can change me. Him I can't change. Him I can't change. Hashem, I can't change anybody. I can change me. If I can change me, that means I have a solution. 
So the first reaction to a hardship, the Bet Levi says, should be to turn to Hashem. After you've reflected, after you've seen, you know what Hashem, I saw, I looked in the mirror, and in reality, my prayers, not so much. Sometimes I forget to pray. Sometimes I eat. I don't forget to eat, but I forget to say Birkat Amazon. To eat, we never forget. Nobody ever forgets to eat. But to say thank you, Hashem, for the food, sometimes we forget. Sometimes. Or what we say, sometimes people say, is there a shorter version of Birkat Amazon? How come there's no, nobody asks for a shorter version of the meal? Is there like a smaller meal? Nobody says, can I have a smaller meal? But they say, can I have a shorter version of Birkat Amazon? How come you had an hour and a half to eat, but you don't have five minutes to thank Hashem for the food? Or sometimes you have people, they say, listen, uh, can I still do tefillin? Why? What's the problem? Why? Well, you don't have an arm? No, no, I have an arm. It's just that it's, uh, it's almost night. It's almost night. Okay, do it. Yeah, as long as it's not night. As long as the sun didn't go down, you can still put on tefillin. The question is, is this the first time or an everyday thing? If it's the first time, okay, everybody has different issues, different reasons of why they forgot or couldn't do tefillin until 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night before it's almost dark. But if it's an everyday thing, then I have to ask you a question. How come you forget to talk to Hashem every morning? What do you think, the neshama came inside the body by itself? What do you think, that your body is running itself? At the very least, you have to say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, by what? By praying in the morning. But you can say, yeah, but I was in a hurry. But yeah, but I was busy. But yeah, I was this. But yeah, I was that. I understand. Everybody's busy. Everybody's in a hurry. Everybody's got stuff to do. <coughs> but you have a responsibility. The success is going to come from. If you think it's going to come from you, from your skill set, from your strength, from your efforts, then you're already going about your way in the wrong direction. Or, for example, sometimes people say to me, listen, how come I can't find a job? Or how come I don't have enough money? So I say, listen, let's look at, there's a checklist. A checklist of a few things that cause you to have money problems. There's many things that cause money problems, according to the Torah, but there's a checklist. These are the big things. Check number one, do you keep Shabbat? Oh, yeah, yeah, I keep Shabbat. I only drive on Shabbat. Okay, that means you don't keep Shabbat. No, no, I keep Shabbat. I only play with my phone on Facebook on Shabbat. Okay, that means you don't keep Shabbat at all. At all, you don't keep Shabbat. Why? It actually could be worse than driving. Playing on Facebook on Shabbat could be worse than driving on Shabbat. Why? Driving, there's a limited amount of people that are going to see you drive. So it's a limited amount of Chilul Hashem. Facebook, you have 5,000 friends, all of them saw that you're on Facebook on Shabbat. So don't ask, how come I don't have a... What do you mean you don't have? You're lucky you're still alive. You're on borrowed time. Hashem said, somebody violates Shabbat, he's going to kill him. The fact that you're alive is a miracle. So, rule number one, you keep Shabbat? Okay, if you keep Shabbat, you have a check, we go to the next one. Go to the next one. How about wasting seed? Oh, no, no, I don't waste seed. It's just that uh, we're not ready to have kids yet. Well, now, you know, a lot of guys, they get married, but they're not ready to have kids yet. Okay, but what do you mean you're not ready to have kids yet? You just, if it comes, you're just going to be disappointed, or you're not ready because you're doing things that are not allowed? If you're doing things that are not allowed, whether it's what the Goyim call protection, which is uh, protection for, uh, for all of, you know, one room. Protection for one room for all of the sins to go into. Protection for those sins. Because of the genome that person is going to get for wasting seed. Or, it's a, uh, they're doing things like Eren Onan. Where instead of doing things the normal way, they do things an abnormal way. Then that person, Hashem gives them Shefa, we call it. Which is salvation, good blessings and he wastes it through his seed. Why? Because that seed is his panasa. So he gives it to all of the demons that he creates every time he wastes it. And the woman, whether she's his wife or his girlfriend or whoever Hashem and Hashem can be, she's partner in the crime 100%. They're both going to have a nice villa in Gainom. Yeah, but they're married and they keep Shabbat. Okay, so first thing they were good. But in Gainom they also have a section for people to keep Shabbat. They do, but man, no, Rashid Chokhmah says, people that keep Shabbat, keep, keep, keep Shabbat, they have a special section in Genom. Why? They have a section in Genom where the, the fire is off on Shabbat. The, fire is off. It's the rest of the week it works, though. The rest of the week it works. 
So now, if he did Baruch Hashem, did Shuba, he did stop wasting seed. Then he knows, oh, okay, so this cannot be the reason. I'm not wasting seed, so that means that, Baruch Hashem, two checks. Three, you have Shalom Bait. When your wife, when your wife sees you, does she smile or she just, she's like scared to see you. What is he going to say next? She says, she's like, she's not sure what he's going to say next. If that's what, you, if that's the kind of wife you have, you have a very serious problem. If your husband, every time, Somebody mentions his, the, the wife's name. He says, "Yeah, Hashem <laughs> Yeah, that's my wife. Like he's like he's like embarrassed. That's his wife. You don't have shalom bayit. Unfortunately, many homes, many homes are like that. How do you know? How many of you know guys and girls that are married that go on vacation by themselves without their spouse? Raise your hand. You don't have to be embarrassed. They don't know. They're not here. How many of you know people that are married, they're married, but they go on vacation without their spouse? I'm not talking about business trips. Business trips happen. You don't have to bring your wife or your husband everywhere you go. But I'm talking about a married guy, but he wants to go to a vacation with the guys. Or a woman, she's married, but she's going on vacation with the girls, not with the husband. How many of you know people like this? Okay. Baruch Hashem, a good amount of you. Not a single one of those people have Shalom Bayit. How do I know without knowing them? Baruch Hashem, after being married for about 16 years now, you learn about Shalom Bayit whether you want it or not. When you have Shalom Bayit, when you have peace in the home, that means that you want to be with your spouse all the time, especially during free time. You want to experience all the good things, all the fun things with your spouse. Now vacation, for most people, that's like their highlight. That's where I want to be. Everybody works the whole year so they can take one or two weeks off for vacation. So if you work the whole year to save up for this one week vacation, but you decided to take it with somebody that's not your spouse, guess what? You probably don't want to be with your spouse. You probably don't want to be with them. You probably want to be with somebody else. Your friends, yourself, somebody else maybe. It's definitely not your spouse. Why? Because if you want to be with your spouse, then you're going to be with them, especially during the fun times. And unfortunately today, it's become very, very common for men and women to go away on vacation without their spouse. But that's also the reason why the divorce rate is increasing rapidly every year, over 80% in Western society. And unfortunately, it's even affecting the Jewish world. And it all starts with these vacations and other things that we forget about that are so simple. Yes, you have a question? Yes. For which part? Yeah, well, the, uh, when, when, there's a, uh, when there's a missing ingredient, all parties that are involved, all parties that are involved are, uh, are guilty. It cannot be a one-way street. Meaning, if she's trying everything she can, but he's just a psychopath, then no, she's obviously not at fault. She did everything she can. She's uh, constantly trying to please him, but he's just a mental case. Ah, that's not her fault. But it doesn't usually work that way. Usually one thing leads to the other. Sometimes it's not something so, so obvious. So for example, many times you see couples that are unhappy with each other, but they don't know why. He's good looking, she's good looking, he has money, she has money. They loved each other like little everything. Everything was perfect before they got married. As soon as they got married, Tish Abav. As soon as they got married, it was like uh, they were morning day. Why? What happened? Because once a, two Neshamot get together, the responsibility increases drastically. And the outcome of your actions, both of your actions affect each other. For example, if a man, a married man, wastes seed, his wife is not going to know. Why? He's not doing it in front of her, at least in most normal cases. I've actually had cases where the wife knew, but that's not a normal case. Normal cases, she doesn't know. He, I don't know, he's in the bathroom, he's in the, wherever he is. And she doesn't know. But for some reason, every, one, every time he wants to give her like a hug, 
Hey, honey, how are you? She's like disgusted by him. She doesn't want to be next to him. She always has a headache. She has like a permanent headache. Permanent headache every time he's next to her. Why? She thinks it's just because she's, she's really tired. She thinks, oh, it's, I just don't feel like it. He thinks, oh, yeah, she's really tired. Oh, really, she doesn't feel like it. No, no, it's not that. It's not that. You know what the secret is? Har neshama knows everything. Har neshama knows the sins he's making, knows that he's cheating on her with the Satan's wife, because that's what happens with the seed. And Har neshama is disgusted by him and therefore repels him. Doesn't want to be next to him. Why? What normal woman would want to be with a guy she knows is cheating? How many of you women want to go with a guy that's going to cheat on you? How many? Raise your hand. Even as a joke, you're not going to raise your hand. Why? What are you out of your mind, Rabbi? <laughs> what, have I, do I have my missing arm or something? Why, why would I be with such a moron? Why would I be such a guy? No. Guess what, guys? Every single time a man wastes seed, it's like he's cheating on his wife. It's just that the wife is not a physical one. It's not the one that he was at the office that he thought was cute. It's the one that's in his mind. Now, this causes a lot of slumbite problems. This is also the reason why guys try to run away from their wives, go on vacations, the wives want to get away, they run away from their husbands, and so on and so forth. So when a person has these problems, a person has these issues where they have bad slumbite, they have bad parnasa, they have all of these different things, instead of trying harder, you know what, maybe we should go to a marriage counselor. Maybe we should watch a movie together. Maybe we should make dinner night. Maybe we should walk the dog together. None of those things are going to help you. It may be a nice way to waste your life, nice way to, I don't know, give the dog a little fresh air. Maybe the, 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 you know, Hollywood's going to make a few dollars more because you watched the movie, but it's not going to fix your marriage. It's not going to fix your panasa, it's not going to fix anything. Why? Because you haven't fixed yourself yet. So the first and most important thing is that a person needs to see what am I doing wrong according to the book. According to the book. Now, this could be something that even someone that's smart, someone that's righteous, someone that is even called a prophet in the Torah can make a mistake like this. And last week's parasha was Parashat Korach. How many of you know the story of Korach? You with me? Okay. So, Korach, most people, when they picture Korach, they picture some gangster. Or some guy that's just a... Uh, no, no. Korach was actually a tzaddik. Korach was actually a righteous person that went wrong. How did he go wrong? He saw through prophecy that his descendant, his great-grandson, is going to be Shmuel. Shmuel Anavi, Shmuel the prophet. And he already knew that Shmuel is going to be as righteous and as great as Moshe and Aaron together. He saw this, that Shmuel is coming from him. So he figured, wait a minute, if Shmuel is coming from me, of course that I'm right over Moshe Rabbeinu. I have a debate with Moshe Rabbeinu. There's no way that Hashem is going to kill me if Shmuel has to come from me. Why? Because how is he going to come? How is Shmuel going to come if I'm going to die? Why? Because until this moment, everybody's on the same team. Him, his wife, the 250 rabbis, his sons. He said, how could I lose a debate if, Shmuel, if Hashem, Hashem needs me to have Shmuel? That's the mistake. Never in his wildest dreams did he reflect on himself to think, wait a minute. Yes, Hashem showed me that Shmuel is coming for me to show me what potential I have. But Hashem doesn't need me. And Hashem has many, many ways to bring Shmuel into the world. He never thought about this for a second. He limited Hashem, and what he didn't see was the fact that his three sons were going to do tshuva, leave him, go and join Moshe Rabbeinu in the last minute, and him and the 250 rabbis and his wife were all going to go to Gainom, and his sons were going to become tzaddikim gmurim, and from there, Shmuel came. He never reflected. He never reflected. And that's why Rabotai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, after this whole thing happened, if you remember from reading the parasha, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Moshe Rabbeinu, take all of the pens 
that the rabbis and Korach, they brought a korban. They brought different uh, things. They use this for Abu Hashem. They use this for a sacrifice. Take all of those pans. Don't throw them out. Make a casing, a cover for the altar, for the Mizbeach. Why? Why? These people, Rashaim, they're wicked people. You just killed them, Hashem. Because, yeah, I killed them. But what they did, they still did something good. So I want to show you, and I want to remind everybody who's going to bring a, uh, a korban, a sacrifice, that sometimes, even if what you do is good, if it's not with the permission of Hashem, if it does not have the signature of Hashem, that you're doing it the right way, not just doing something good, but you're doing it the right way, then it's no good. And this will be the reminder, make a casing for the altar. So that way, every time somebody else brings a sacrifice, says it's not enough to just do something good. It's do it the way that Hashem said so. It's not enough to just say, oh yeah, I learned Torah. I learned Torah. Yeah, if you learn Torah, but you don't know how to behave, then your Torah goes in the garbage pail. A lot of times you have people, they learn a lot of Torah, but their wives are suffering at home. Cry all day. They call me. They cry. Oh, what happened? Oh, my, my, husband, uh, my husband keeps yelling at me. What, what, did, what did you do that he's yelling at you? Nothing. Well, what do you mean you did nothing? He has nothing to do. He just feels like yelling at you. I don't know. He keeps blaming me that we don't have any money. He keeps blaming me that we don't have enough kids. He keeps blaming me that I did this. He keeps blaming me that I don't clean the bathroom 87 times a day. He keeps blaming me that the, the floor is not shining, that he can see his reflection. He keeps blaming me for all of his problems. He keeps bl blaming me for somebody else's problems. He blames me for everything. I'm like the Koban. I said, okay, so you should tell your husband. The Rabbi Reuben told him all the Torah that he learned all day in the Kolel. All the Torah they learn in the Shiu, all the Torah they learn his entire life goes right in the same place as Korach. Garbage pail. Why? The Torah is a tool to fix yourself. If you learn it without fixing yourself, you're misusing the tool. You're misusing the tool. So that's what the Bet Levi tries to tell us here is that yes, you're supposed to pray to Hashem. But don't just think that you can pray to Hashem whenever you feel like it. After all, hell breaks loose. You have to pray to Hashem before you start the mission, during the mission, and after the mission. Before the problem, during the problem, and after the problem. That way, in the beginning, you first tell Hashem, Hashem, I know I can only succeed because of you. Then during the thing, Hashem, I know that I'm only succeeding because of you. And after you've succeeded or failed, you say, Hashem, I know that whatever it was, success or failure, both of them came from you. That way, you have Hashem in your mind at all times. That way, you can build your connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, sometimes we have a problem when we pray and that we forget what we're praying about. How many of you have had a situation, don't be embarrassed, I'll raise my hand too, where you prayed, but you forgot where you're at at the Sidur? No, if all of you don't raise your hand, me too. Sometimes you pray, and somehow you ended up birkat amazon. You don't know how it's there. You're not, you didn't eat nothing. Birkat amazon. How did I get to birkat amazon? I don't even have any pizza next to me or nothing. I happen. Ever happened? It happens, right? There was one time a guy praying, and his friend is watching him. He's praying, praying, and he sees his friend praying, praying, praying like this, and he goes like this. So, so he thought it was a gang sign. So at the end of the day, he said, wait, are you part of a gang? Blue, red, which one are you? He goes, no, 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 what happened? What happened? What, what, what was this? What was this? What are you, uh, uh, Nixon, the former president of America? Peace sign, what is this? What is it? He goes, no, I was thinking about the vacation I'm going tomorrow. And I started visualizing myself on a vacation, and the waitress came and I said, two beers, two beers. <laughs> two beers. The guy is already, he's praying to Hashem, but he forgot he's on vacation. Now let me ask you, how many of you, if you were God, you want that prayer? You want that prayer, the guy saying this? Huh? It's better than nothing when Hashem is uh, homeless? I have a question. prayer. So sometimes, sometimes we pray, I'll answer your question, don't worry. Sometimes we pray and we forget that we're praying. Sometimes we forget why we're praying, Bichlal. 
The reason for this, Rabotai, and it seems like you guys have a lot of questions. I'll open up for questions after I make this point, I promise. The reason for this is because sometimes we've prayed so many times, unlike the Christians that pretend like they're praying once a week, and the Arabs that pray five times a day but then they kill people, and all of the other crazy people in the world, we pray three times a day as Jews, but sometimes we pray so much we forget what the whole prayer is about. We forget. It's like we get used to it. You know all the words by heart. You know, you're kind of proud of yourself. You know a 300-page book by heart. How many people you know that are not Jewish know a 300-page book by heart? Nobody. Jews know if you know how to pray, you know a 300-page book by heart. So you know it by heart, you get so comfortable, you forget what you're even saying. We call this ergel. Ergel meaning you got used to it. Now at the time of the Bet HaMikdash, the third one that's coming, Bezad Hashem, the Sefer Yechezkel, Ezekiel, says there's going to be rules. One of the rules that it says is going to be in the Bet HaMikdash, in chapter 46, verse number 9, he says that if you enter the Bet HaMikdash in the northern gate, you have to leave in the southern gate. If you enter in the eastern gate, you have to leave in the western gate. Now, somebody asked me last week how many stones were in the Bet HaMikdash. Somebody asked me, who was here? Did somebody here that asked me? Somebody asked me a question last week. How many stones are in the Bet HaMikdash, right? Okay, there's no answer. Baruch Hashem. So I didn't get it wrong. There's just no answer. There's estimates, but there's no answer. Now, the Arabait, the Arabait was like I told you, three football fields by three football fields square. Now, the Bet HaMikdash is huge in so many words. Huge. Harabait is huge. So now imagine, third Bet HaMikdash is built, Bezat Hashem. You go with your nice car. You go enter. Now in Israel, any of you guys been to Israel? You guys all, been to, all of you been to Israel? You remember how hot it is in Israel in the summer? Imagine, imagine you go into like in August. It's hot. Almost as hot as this room right now. Hot, right? Now imagine... They tell you, uh, listen, yes, sir, thank you for coming to the Bet HaMikdash. This way, this way, this way. Now you want to go back. You parked on the Eastern Gate. You're trying to get out. You're like, hey, hey, what are you doing, sir? You want, you want death penalty? Well, hey, what death penalty? I just prayed to Hashem. What death penalty? If you leave from the same gate you entered, death penalty. Hey, 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 relax, Mr. Uh, Rabbi. Hey, relax yourself with your big beard. I'll go to a different gate. But I, I parked over here, right outside the gate. I get here early. I got here early, so I could park here. He goes, okay, you got here early to get here. Great, but you have to leave in the opposite gate. But you know how long it's going to take me to get to the opposite end and then go all the way around this huge building? You're talking about another hour and a half, two hours of time. Why can't I, My car is right there. It's right outside the door. I can see it. Sorry, sir, you cannot. If you leave, you break through us, we have to kill you. What kind of rule is this? What are we, fanatics? Now the Yavits, the Hasid Yavits from a few hundred years ago said fantastic, fantastic information for all of you. It's worth a million dollars. We'll take payments. Now, what did he say? He says the rule is you are not allowed to leave from the same gate that you entered, the Bet HaMikdash. Why? Because if you leave from the same gate you entered, you will see the same wall of the Bet HaMikdash twice in one day. And if you see the wall of the Bet HaMikdash twice in one day, maybe your mind will get used to it and the walls of the Bet HaMikdash will start looking to you like the walls in your house. Where you feel to go in, free to go out, you get used to it. And chas v'shalom, that you get used to the Bet HaMikdash. What do we learn from this? We learn from this Rabotai is that when we get used to things, unfortunately we stop appreciating them. If you get used to your wife, you stop appreciating her. You get used to your husband, you stop appreciating him. You get used to your kids, you stop appreciating them. You get used to your job, you stop appreciating it. You get used to the Torah, you stop appreciating it. And what does that lead us to? It leads us to Hashem having to rebuke us. How does He rebuke us? He gives us a problem from what we got used to. You got used to your kids, I'll give you a problem with the kids. You got used to your husband, all of a sudden your husband's not used to you. You got used to your wife, all of a sudden your wife, the wife doesn't want to talk to you. 
all of a sudden you have a problem from the things that you thought were good. Why? Hashem says you have to fix this. You have to fix this. Now, Bechavod, you have a question. Go ahead. Um, backtracking a little bit. Bechavod. Why is it looked down upon for a guy to go alone on a trip with the boys? Is he married? Um, well, not, not per se, but in general. Okay. If, yes. okay. if he's married, if a man is married, then he has different responsibilities than a 17, 18, 19 year old kid that doesn't have a responsibilities. He has a wife, he has kids assuming, he has a life. So for him to go and put everything on hold, to go hang out with the boys, that means that his priorities are not straight. Because even if, let's say, for example, financially he's not worried. He has a bunch of money to burn for a few generations. Kids, Baruch Hashem, he has the kids. His wife doesn't want any more kids right now. Uh, the wife is there. She's not going anywhere. It's still not good for him to go alone. Why? If you're going to go have a good time, why don't want you take the most important people in your life with you? Why? Why are your friends more important than your family? They're not more important. If your friends are more important than your family, you have a very serious problem. Now, if it's a single guy, if it's a single guy, which is more relevant to the vast majority of you, going away on his own, it's not problematic, assuming you're going on a kosher vacation. Now, if you're going to, let's say, the Kivret uh, Tzadikim, you're going to different places in Eretz Yisrael to go pray at, uh, next to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's grave, or the Rambam, or Rabbi Akiva, all the tzaddikim, you want to, you know, uh, learn together, pray together, do great things like that, Chazak Baruch go, a lot of tzaddikim do this. No problem. But, if you're going to Vegas, if you're going to the beach, if you're going to some Luna Park, where everybody over there is naked, the Torah doesn't say it's, a, uh, it's, it's frowned upon. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. You know what the Torah says? The Torah says, Areg ve'al yavo. Torah says it's better that you die than go on this vacation. Doesn't say it's frowned upon. Doesn't say that. Just says it's better you die instead. Why? Because there's a sin called Gilui Arayot. Gilui Arayot is immorality. Immorality is whether it's a having sex with your own mother or your sister or your wife that's Nida or a prostitute or a Goya or even looking at it. Meaning, Rabotai Yekarim, Gilui Arayot, according to the Torah, is one of the three Ikarim. Three things in the Torah that a person has to die and not commit the sin. The other two are idolatry. Somebody tells you, go pray to J.C. Penny. Go pray to Jesus or I'll kill you. You have to die. Somebody else tells you, go kill this guy or I'll kill you. You have to die. Your blood is not redder than his. You're not allowed to kill anybody, even to save your own life. Last but not least, you're not allowed to make a sex crime. Sex crime in Torah means everything I just mentioned to you with a few others. Point being, Rabotai, is that if the guys are going to a place where there's going to be znut, there's going to be immorality, there's going to be the, you know, people walking around naked in the beach. And by the way, when I say naked, I don't literally mean naked like people think. Naked also means immodest. Naked means a woman walking around with a bikini or something like that. Unfortunately, people walking on the streets over here like this also. This, Rabotai, if it happens that you're walking on the street, somebody walks around like that, it's not your fault. You look away. But if you're going to the place where you know for sure that's all they have over there, then you have a very serious problem. Why? Because you're going to go look at her, and then that image is going to enter your mind and will never leave. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. The best case scenario is if you do tshuva for this image that's in your mind, that you saw in a movie, that you saw in real life, the best case scenario is you do tshuva, you regret it, you cry about it, and it just gets pushed back in your mind that you don't think about it as often. That's the best case scenario. But once your neshama sees something, it records it for eternity. So now, if you and the boys are going to such a place of immorality, then what are you doing? The Torah says you're going to murder your own neshama. Why murder your neshama? Why? Why are you doing this to your neshama? Hashem gave you a perfect neshama, you're going to ruin it? No, don't do it. She doesn't want you to ruin your neshama. Why? Now, I'm going to speak to you guys in your language. Any, anybody here married? Nobody's married yet, right? Okay. One day you're going to get married, right? And Bezalel Hashem, you're going to have kids, right? You know, everybody plans to have kids or just dogs? Kids too, right? Okay. No, today in modern society, people don't want kids. They want dogs. They want two kids and a dog. 
or uh, two dogs and a kid. You know, it's like it has to match somehow. Like uh, they have to put it on YouTube or on Facebook. Look, I have two dogs and the kid too in the back walking the dogs. Free dog walker. But you want kids, right? There's another shame you're gonna have kids. Now you're gonna have kids just like you. You're gonna have kids just like you. Now, how many of you realize what it takes to have a kid? Now, obviously, the woman has to carry this kid for nine months. It's hard. It's hard. I was, I was never pregnant. I looked pregnant, but I was never pregnant. I promise you. I was never pregnant, but I can tell you for sure after having three kids, I know for sure it's hard. It's hard. It's hard on the body during. It's hard on the body after. Now, after the wife carries these kids for nine months, ooh, wow, how much pain she goes through. And she delivers the kids. And then she has to take care of the kids. And she has to feed the kids. And they never sleep. Women never sleep, by the way. Don't ask them, when do you sleep? They don't sleep. Why? Because they have to feed the kids. And then change the kids. And then feed them again. And change the kids. And then go. Oh, maybe the kid doesn't want to go to sleep. So they can't go to sleep. Ooh, wow. It's so hard to raise the kids. Now, after you raise this kid for 15, 16, 17 years, now this little cute little girl comes, hey, Abba, Abba, how are you? Abba, Abba, how are you? You're so happy to see this kid. Now, how if you saw this little 15, 16 year old little cute kid that you just gave your whole life for? Now, you didn't carry the kid, but you worked. All the money goes to the kids, to the wife, to everything else. Now, this little 16 year old kid says, Abba, meet my boyfriend, Jose. We're getting married because I'm pregnant. How would you feel? You know, I know all of you guys are young still. Now you're all young, but you could think. You could think like old. You just raised this kid, gave your whole life for this kid, and the kid comes to you, this little cute little peaches kid, beautiful kid, and she says, Hi, Abba. Here's Mustafa. <laughs> Mustafa is uh, running for president of Hamas. We're having a baby. We're going to call him Muhammad. No? Assalamu alaikum, Abba. No? No? How many of you guys are proud of your daughter still? How many of you are regret the day she was born and the day you were born? <laughs> well, guess what? Guess what, Rabotai? Guess what, Rabotai? Guess what? You don't want this girl, right? You don't want this kid? You don't want this, your daughter coming to you saying, Abba! I mean, Mustafa are getting married. No, you don't want that, right? Guess what? When you touch a Bat Israel, when you touch a Bat Israel, today, now, before getting married, you are doing the same thing you don't want done to you. And Akadosh Baruch Hu says, Mida keneged mita, lo paska me'olam. Measure for measure that was not removed from the world. You do it, you go find a Bat Israel and touch her without being married. Guess what? One day, you get a little older, you invest your whole life into raising kids. Your little kid's going to come home, not so precious, not so innocent, but she's going to come home with Mustafa. You understand? So now, when a person thinks, wait a minute, who needs these problems? Okay, I'm not ready to get married. Okay, I'm not ready to have kids. But I definitely don't want to set myself up for failure. I don't want to set myself up for failure that Hashem has to repay me back for the things that I did. So guess what? Okay, don't touch me, don't look at me. I just want to do what I need to do in this world. I want to work, I want to learn, I want to do what Hashem wants me to do. When I'm ready to get married, the time's going to come, Be'ezrat Hashem. Why? You don't want these problems. You don't want these problems. Now unfortunately, sometimes people don't like to listen to me, so they do things on their own. So, I have, almost on a monthly basis, unfortunately, I have young kids coming to me from different places around the world, telling me about their troubles. And already, more than a few times, I've had to convince kids that they're making, they made a mistake, but they're going to make a bigger one. What's the bigger one? They made a mistake by having intimacy before getting married. But now, they say, listen, I loved him, he was such a cute guy, but now that I'm pregnant, he doesn't want to be with me. He doesn't want to be with me anymore because he's not ready to be a husband. Yeah, but he was acting like a husband. But yeah, but he wasn't ready to be a husband. So he said we should, uh, we should terminate it. That's what the medical term is for murder. He wants to have an abortion. Now, you should know just a small little tidbit about abortions. Number one, it's considered 100% murder. After 40 days, at the 40th day, the neshama enters the baby. It's 100% a living, breathing being. So if you do it before the 40 days... 
well, there's nothing to do it for. If you take, a, let's say, for example, a morning after pill, which unfortunately some people make the mistake and, st- and end up having to take the morning af- pill, after pill, it's not a open permission to do such a thing, but if somebody were to do that, they made less mistakes, put it that way. It's still a mistake, but nonetheless a mistake. Because once there's 40 days pass, then it's considered 100% murder. Unfortunately, most people don't discover that the woman is pregnant for the first day or or first week or second week. Usually they find out after she's missed her period, which is already after a month. And most of the time, she doesn't tell you or she feels bad or she missed it and it's not regular. And what ends up happening, she tells you after she's already two, three, four, five months pregnant. And guess what? She says, I'm not ready to be an ima. And you say, guess what? I'm not ready to be an abba. Oh, okay, let's go to the clinic. Look, I'll take care of it. Okay, now, in Shemaim, you have two things. One, you're both considered murderers. What happens to murderers? Nothing good. I'll give you an example. Now, if you ever want to know what happens to an aborted baby, text me, I'll send you some videos. I'll show you exactly what happens to them. But you need to know this. Why? Because if you ever have in your mind for a second to do such a thing, just know, midah ke neged midah, measure for measure. You kill a baby, you have to come back as a baby that gets killed. That's not fun. Now, if you've made that mistake already, and you didn't know, Baruch Hashem. Why? Number one, the punishment is less. Number two, you could do tshuva. You could do tshuva, serious tshuva, First and foremost, take on yourself all of the mitzvot. Second of all, never let another person touch you unless you're married to them. Third and most importantly, you have to get other people to know what I just told you. Either by sending them the shiur, sending them our other shiurim, connecting them with, with us, whatever it is. You have to publicize the truth to people. Why? Because right now, people think that the worst thing that ever happened is the Holocaust. Six million Jews died, right? A million of them were kids. A million kids would die, die, would get murdered, cold blood, in the Holocaust. But guess what? Since the Holocaust, until today, 36 million Jewish babies have been aborted. 36 million. Six times, six times, were were killed in the Holocaust. Why? Because today, it's become, well, what's the big deal? Well, it's just a pill. Well, it's just a little procedure. Ah, it's a big thing. In Shemaim, it's a very big thing. And any woman that experienced it, she'll tell you, it's a very big thing you don't want to experience. So I promise you, Rabotai, you don't want to make some of these. Some of these mistakes seem like they're not a big deal, but they are. They are. They are a very, very big deal. You have to know what you're dealing with here. It's not worth it for you guys to touch anybody unless you're married to them, because it's only going to lead you to trouble. Now, these vacations, to go back to your fantastic question that led us to so many places, these vacations, if it's a kosher destination, that's going to lead you to get closer to Hashem, to, uh, to do something good in the world, no problem. Enjoy the vacation. If you're single, you'll have a responsibility of a wife and kids, no problem. But if it's a non-kosher destination with non-kosher activities, then what do you want? It's only going to lead you to bad. I have one kid contacted me just a few days ago. Grew up in a really religious Haredi house. Haredi, more religious than me. This kid said to me, he says, I don't know what happened to my life, but in a matter of three months, my whole life is upside down. So what happened in three months? The whole life, 25 years, religious, hat, beard, payas, everything good. Rabbi Akiva. No, three months, everything goes upside down. He goes, ah, oh, listen, I don't know. I had to, my, my, my dad told me, maybe I should uh, look for a career. And I said, I don't, know any, you know, I don't know what to do. I learned my whole life. Maybe I'm going to go to college. Maybe I'm going to go to college. So he signed up to go to college. Now, colleges today are not like colleges that they were 100 years ago, we actually go to learn. Colleges today is like legal prostitution. That's what colleges are today. I'm serious. I went to college. I know what they are. Colleges today is legal prostitution. First four years, all you know, all you learn is how, how much you can drink and how much drugs you can do, and how many new partners you're going to have every week, because you're competing with your friends. That's what you learn in college. You do not learn anything about what you're going to use in the world. You don't learn a profession, because you want to learn a profession, you have to go to grad school. You have to spend another fifty, dollars $100,000. You learn nothing in college. That's why Torah says don't go to college. 
You want to learn something? You need to learn a specific uh, task. You want to be an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor. You don't need to go to one of these colleges. You could do homeschool. You could learn college at home. Hashem provided you a way to do good things at home without going to these uh, places. Why? Because these places, unfortunately, are full of people that live a life that's the opposite of Torah. The girls are in a contest. Who's going to have more boyfriends? The guys are in a contest. Who's going to have more girlfriends? And everybody meets every single night, seven days a week, at a place where all that happens is that. So this young man that never saw anything like this in his life went to college in three months. In three months, he never, look, he never even looked at a girl. In three months, he became addicted. Addicted to intimacy to the extent where he started going to prostitutes. It wasn't enough college. He started going to other things. Why? Because Rabbi Taya Karim. Rabbi Yochanan says in the Gemara, Ever katan yesh ba'adam. There's a small member in a man. If you satiate it, you feed it, it'll always be hungry. If you starve it, it'll always be satisfied. It'll be satiated. Meaning, the more active you are, the more you're going to want. The less active you are, the less you're going to want, and you're only going to want it at the appropriate times. When it's a mitzvah, because it's with your wife, with your husband, then if it's a mitzvah, chazakim ubuchim, you're actually fulfilling a mitzvah from the Torah. Po'ubu. But when it's not a mitzvah, guess what? All you're doing is you're destroying yourself. And these places that the Yetzirah has created as your surroundings, whether it's the nightclubs, or it's the, uh, it's the uh, colleges, the, uh, places, all of these places are different traps for the Yetzirah to bring you. Now, if you want to do good things, you want to learn, you want to study, you want to do things, there are plenty of kosher ways to do it. You could ask me for guidance if you want, and give you plenty of different references, and places, and so on and so forth. But I promise you, if you want to live a kosher life, you have an opportunity to do it. If you want to take your chances, Go ahead and do it, but I'm telling you, you're going to lose. And the reason why, the reason why I'm confident to say that is because you see, the world today that we live in is full of losers. It's an 80 plus percent rate of divorce rates. Almost 100 percent of people are miserable. 80 percent get divorced. The rest of them are still miserable, but married. They just don't want to get divorced because of the money, or they don't want to get divorced because they can't afford it, or they can't afford it. Point being, Abutai, is people are miserable. Why? Because they don't have a kadosh baruch in their life. When you don't have a Kadosh Baruch Hu in your life, it is impossible to be happy because your life is going to be full of mistakes. Yes, you have a question. Yeah, so you mentioned um, that if you stay away from it and starve your Yetzirah, Ken. it's satiating. It. Ken. However, and then you said if you like, feed it, feed it then it'll, never, it'll, never, it'll never be satiated. Exactly. So, I don't know. My, my personal like, history, I feel like if I were to stop something, for example, let's say, uh, let's say it's to show my idea. Yes. I I'm in. I stopped being in October, and now I want to, I stop, and I want to, Mizrat Hashem go to Shalom right? Yes, man. So, I feel like it's even more hard than, start, you know. Start. I didn't say it was easy, but it was. So it's harder than even eating it a bit. No, here's the thing. The beginning the beginning of preserving yourself, whether you're a man or a woman, is very difficult. It's very difficult. It doesn't stop right away. The urges that you have don't stop right away. So you're going to have the urges for a while. Now all of you are already at the age or close to the age of you need to get married. Why? Because to preserve yourself for much longer is going to become more and more difficult. Guys, girls, in general, don't be one of these people that's, uh, you know, no, no, I'm not ready to get married. I'm waiting until I'm 25. I'm waiting until I'm 35. I'm waiting until I'm 45. And then you end up being like a lot of people that are 50, still not married. Like everybody thinks that they're just going to find somebody whenever they feel like it. Like it's a hot dog. Like it's a, uh, they, they're going to buy a Snickers bar in the store. And it's always going to be available. Every deli you go to always has Snickers bars. People think they're going to find a husband and a wife like that. Doesn't work that way. You have to make sure that you... Get married when you're supposed to get married, not when you feel like it. Now, when are you supposed to? When you're marriageable age. If you're a man, already at 18 you should be married. 19 already is a, it's considered a delay, which means that all of you are either at that age or close to it. Now I know in modern society that's, that sounds obnoxious and ridiculous, <laughs> but it's true. It's true. Now, 
I know that the generation today is uh, very young-minded, if you will, or immature, you could call it. So for them, to get married at 19 or 20 is completely out of the question. Why? They're thinking, wait, I don't have money yet. I don't have a job yet. I didn't feel a school yet. I didn't do that. You have a whole list of things you didn't do that you feel like you need to do them in order for you to get married. That's one of the ways the Yetzirah convinces you to make more sense. Why? You don't need any of those things to get married. All you need is the willpower. All you need is the willpower to do a mitzvah. Hashem does the rest. What do you think? That Hashem gave you a mitzvah and He's going to you're going to fulfill that mitzvah and he's doing it dafka just to make you fail? Like sometimes people tell me, listen, we're not ready to have kids. Why not? We don't have any money. We don't have any money, so we're not going to have any kids. So what do you think? That Hashem is going to actually, he gave you a mitzvah in the Torah to have kids. Then he's going to allow the seed and the egg to connect in order for the kid to come and go through all of that process of nine months of torture for the woman and the man sometimes. Okay? To bring the kid to the world just so the kid can starve to death? Like, what kind of God do you believe in? What do you think? That Hashem is not going to give you the right amount of money and the right amount of environment and the right amount of everything that you need when you need it? He's not giving it to you now because you don't need it now. He's going to give it to you when you need it. The point being, Rabotai, is that when it comes to marriage, it's not a matter of money. It's not a matter of what kind of job you have. It's a matter of willpower of whether you want to do the will of Hashem or not. Now, I know that mentally, nobody here is ready whether you're 18 or you're 25. No one's ready. Guess what? I'm married for 16 years, I'm still not ready. <laughs> you're never ready. Why? Because marriage, if it's a good marriage, if it's a healthy marriage, it's renewed every day. It's renewed every day. Every day, you learn a little bit more about each other. Every day, you get to know more about each other. Every day is something new. You experience things together. The difference between you being single and you being married is that now married, you fight the battle together. By yourself, go. Suit yourself. Smash your head against the wall yourself. What, are you think you're going to be more successful by yourself? No. You have two. Two are always going to be better than one if it's the right marriage. Now, don't just go on the streets, hey, listen, marry me. No, that doesn't work that way. You don't just pick somebody. Obviously, you have to be attracted to the person. You have to have, uh, you know, a similar mindset, similar likes, similar aspirations, and so on and so forth. You go on a few dates to make sure that they're not crazy, and so on. And after a while, you decide, okay, I want to build a future with this person. That's it. That's enough. That's how marriage is supposed to work. It's not supposed to be where you pretend like you're married for two or three years by living together in a small little apartment your parents are paying for, and once you save enough money to waste it all on a wedding, then you get married. That's what people do. They go, they get married, they borrow money from everybody to get an apartment, they get a dog to make it pretend like they're happily married, so they put pictures on Facebook, and then they say, listen, okay, we're ready to get married. Well, what makes you think you're ready to get married? We saved $50,000. Oh, so you're going to buy a house? No, a wedding. So you're going to spend the whole $50,000 on a wedding? Yeah, what about a house? Oh, no, we're renting. So you're going to spend $50,000 to feed a bunch of strangers for one night that they're still going to complain anyway, but you're not going to have a house. You're not going to have anything else. That's the, that's the mentality of today. We're constantly focused about everybody else. Point being, Abu Tayy Karim, is that life doesn't need to be so difficult. It doesn't need to be so difficult. It's just that most of us are putting the traps in front of ourselves by making decisions that are against the Shem. So yes, if you have somebody special in your life, you have to ask yourself, do I want to be with this person or not? If the answer is yes, then already start talking, discussing, planning marriage in the very near future so you don't destroy your neshamot. If no, break up. Why are you with them? Why are you with this person if you don't want to be with them? Oh, I'm having fun. I'm having fun. So how are you going to feel like your daughter is going to come to you and say, Abba, listen, me and Jose and, and Mustafa, we're all having fun together. We're all having fun together. Oh, anybody's going to marry you? No, no, we're just having fun. What are you, the village bicycle? Everybody's going to, what do you mean having fun? What's the matter with you? What do you mean you're having fun? It's funny, but it's not funny. It's funny, but it's not funny. What do you mean you're having fun? What do you mean you're letting another man put his paws on you for fun? What are you, a pet? <laughs> Why would you let another man touch you if he's not going to put a ring on your finger? Why? 
Why? Why would you let another man look at you in an inappropriate way if he's not going to put a ring on your finger? Why? I'm having fun? Go get a dog. It's funny, but it's not funny. It's funny, I'm laughing too inside. But I know the outside. I know what happens to those parents that cry to me and say, I can't believe it. My daughter was having fun. Now she's, now she's with this guy Mustafa for three years, still having fun. She doesn't want to leave Mustafa. She doesn't want to leave Jose. She doesn't want to leave Steve. She doesn't want to leave David. She doesn't want to leave the guy. Why? They're having fun. Well, yeah, they're having fun, but she's now 28, 29, 30, 35, 36. How long are they having fun? I have one guy that I know he's having fun with his girlfriend 12 years already. 12 years they're having fun. Guess what? As soon as he doesn't want to have fun with her anymore, she's not marriedable anymore. Not because of our age. Not because of our age. There's, there's people available for everybody. But nobody wants somebody else's problems. After he leaves her, after 12, 13 years, guess what? She's going to be a basket case. And no one wants to marry a basket case. No one wants to marry the girl that was somebody else's for 13, 14 years. So this is what you girls have to think about before you let any guy even look at you. This is what you guys have to think about. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time with these, these, these waste of time relationships. I understand getting married was not something you thought you are going to learn about or even think about today. But I promise you, you're doing yourself a service by if you're not ready, don't touch. If you're ready, go for it. But point being, Abu Tai, is that don't treat yourself like pets. Don't treat yourself like a garbage pail that everybody's allowed to look at you, touch you. You are a child of God. You're not public property. Don't treat yourself like it. Next question. No? Yes. Unintentional wasting seed, meaning that the guy uh, did it unintentionally, whether it's because he saw something during the day at some point and then he dreamt about it uh, and uh, he went to sleep and seed came out as a result of that. It's still a sin. He goes to the sixth level of Gainom. Uh, if a, a sixth level of Genome, for anyone who wants to know the details, can watch my shiur about Genome. It's not a fun place. I believe it has green fire. Seven, the, the intentional seed, if he doesn't do tshuva, he goes to the seventh level. And the seventh level doesn't end. So that's not fun either. It's, but it's just much worse. Was it something that I said? <laughs> no, next, yes. I thought what dreams were allowed because it, who says allowed? It's, it's in your sleep, so it's it's all unintentional. You don't know what you're dreaming about. You don't like just like what you said on on all the other shulim. Um, Ninety-nine percent of your dreams you don't remember. So right. when you're dreaming, it's sort of not your fault, but at the same time it is because some of some of the things that you saw in the day, or maybe it's the way that you think. But like your answer is in your question. That, uh, your answer is in your question. So what's the answer? The Gemara Masechet Abu Dazara says, watch what you look at during the day so the ra, the evil, does not come to you at night. What's evil? Evil is wasting seed. Meaning that although it's not intentional sin, meaning the person did it themselves intentionally, it's still considered a sin because it's, a, it's still a result of your actions. You still looked at something that was inappropriate. So that led to that. So that's what the Gemara says. Warning. Don't look at things that are inappropriate. Don't look at a woman that's not your wife. Don't look at things on the internet. Don't look at uh, all the billboards out there. Pretty much watch your eyes. Because if you don't watch your eyes, it's only a matter of time before that's going to lead you to dream about those things. Whatever you saw. You saw an, uh, an attractive woman on a billboard or on the internet or Shalom, you saw some type of uh, Hollywood movie. You saw it. Naturally, that's going to create something in your mind. At some point, that is going to create a dream. That dream will lead to wasting seed. So yes, you didn't intentionally actively do it yourself, but you still did it yourself. Meaning it's still a result of your actions. What is that like? If, let's say, for example, 
you are target practicing. You went to the shooting range, there's one by my house, and you went to the shooting range. And you started targeting practice, target practice, target practice, and you're having a good time, right? But then, you know, you started like, you wanted to pretend like you're like a little cowboy. You started, started, you know, playing with the gun. You know, flipping it, having fun. And next thing you know, a bullet came out, shot somebody in the face. And killed them. Now, are you guilty or no? Why are you guilty? You didn't mean to shoot him in the face. You didn't mean to shoot him in the face. But it was still as a result of your actions. You understand? Same thing if somebody speeds. They're, no, they're in a hurry to go to a job interview. They're going to get a job interview to get a million dollars a day at this job. So they don't want to be late. So they're driving 130, 140 miles per hour on the highway. Driving, 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 driving. Next thing you know, they hit somebody. They kill them. Now, are they guilty or innocent? They're guilty. But they didn't mean to kill them. They meant to go to a place uh, in a hurry. They, all they wanted to do is go to work. They wanted to get a job to make money so they could give staka and do all these good things. Yes, your intentions could be good, but the way you did it was not. So the point being is that yes, a person does not mean to waste seed, but the Torah says if you do such and such, it's going to lead to it. That's why you have to protect your eyes because your eyes are the windows to your soul. Once you allow your eyes to look at something, you are in essence recording that permanently. So you look at a woman that's not your wife, that image is going to be in your mind forever. And it's only going to come to you at the most inappropriate times. This is the reason why marriage psychologists, many of them, ruin marriages. Marriage psychologists or psychiatrists, they think that they're giving people marriage advice, but many times they ruin marriage by telling people that maybe your, uh, your, uh, your sex life is not good, so maybe you guys should watch movies together, inappropriate movies. Or maybe you should do this, maybe you should do uh, They advise them to do all types of crazy things. To any normal person, it's crazy, but to them, it seems appropriate. Now, what ends up happening is that that person sees an image of a woman, and now he thinks of that woman while he's with his wife. Now, is he married to the woman or is he married to the wife? Married to his wife. Torah says something like that happens in a person's life. In Shemaim, they're not really, you know, they say maybe that's not really his kid either. There's a problem with that kid. There's a problem with that kid. The neshama that, that kid's going to get is going to be a problematic neshama. Point being, Rabotai, is that your mind is a very, very special place. And if you allow your eyes to look at anything, you're allowing things to enter your mind and they won't leave. So if you see movies, whether it's a, I'm not even talking about the obvious movies. I'm talking about even just like Hollywood movies, uh, I don't know, X-Men or something like that, where pretty much everybody over there is wearing bodysuits. Even that's inappropriate for a Jew to watch. It's inappropriate for anybody to watch. Needless to say for Jews. Why? Because you're going to think of people that they're supposed to look like this, and you're going to have that in your mind when, when you are with your wife, when you are with your husband. That's when the Satan enters at the most inappropriate time. The only other time he enters is when you pray. You pray to Hashem, you say, I'm Hashem, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All of a sudden you have an image of this woman in your mind. Why? That's exactly the spot that the Satan wants to break you. Either during the time that's the most inappropriate because you're with your wife, or it's inappropriate because you're praying to Hashem. So imagine you come to, uh, you know, the president of uh, the most important company in the world is going to give you a job with millions and millions of dollars, and what do you do the whole time? You're praising his competition. The whole time, instead of going to the interview, say, listen, your company is great. I really want to work for you guys. You guys do great things, and so on and so forth. Say, you know what? Your competition is much better than you guys. You guys suck. You guys are the worst. Ah, your product, I'll throw it in the garbage. The whole time, you're praising his competition. That's not going to be a good look. You're probably not going to get the job. That's what happens. We go to pray, sometimes with things that are inappropriate in our mind. When we do that, Hashem takes our prayer and uh, doesn't treat it too well. Doesn't treat it too well. Why? Because we didn't treat it too well. So we have to make sure that whatever we allow our eyes to look at is something we want in our mind. Now in the beginning it's a little difficult because we're so used to looking at anything that moves. But after a while it becomes a little easier. You start getting yourself used to. As soon as you see something inappropriate, you look away. You study about the subject, you realize how much merit you have in heaven for doing it. And over time, you get more and more used to it. But it takes constant training, constant doing. And Bezalel Hashem, eventually you get to a point where you don't have these dreams or even these experiences. If at all, it becomes very, very random and uh, infrequent. In the beginning, 
it's very common to stop doing it actively yourself and then you have these dreams almost on a regular basis because your body has gotten used to it. But after a while, if you continue staying strong, little by little those dreams will become less frequent. Eventually they'll become almost non-existent. But a lot of the time you see people are holding themselves back and they're not doing anything with these women and uh, when they go back home, you know, it gets to a point where it's like, okay, I haven't done anything with women, I'm keeping that. But at the same time, you know, like I've always wanted to. So when they go to sleep, that's what they think of. And then when they wake up in the morning, you know, yes. that's what happens. So at the same time, that person is doing the right thing, but Half of it. why should it be his fault that, you know, he's the one that, that's following what's going on and he wakes up in the morning and, you know, that, that's just what happened, you know? Right, because, so it's like this. He followed the inst half the instructions. Mm -hmm. He followed the half the, the half, first half says, don't touch a woman that's not your wife. That's good. You get a high five in Shemaim. The other part says, don't look either. If she's not your wife, don't look at her. If you don't look at her, you're not going to have her in your mind. You're not going to think about her. You're not going to think that you want her. You're not going to think that you don't want her. You're not going to think about her at all. So that's the other half. Don't follow your heart. Don't follow your eyes. Why? Your heart wants to be with her, but you say, no, no, no. Hashem said no until I get married. Okay, but also don't follow your eyes. Don't look at her either. Why? Because if you look at her, it'll also lead to a sin. Just a different type of sin. Just a different type of sin. So the point being is that, yes, he did right, but only half the battle. He just has to complete the other half. That's also a good thing. Why? Because it means that he only has half the equation to fix. Most people have the whole thing. Most people already, uh, you know, I have, I have many, many students, unfortunately, have become sex addicts. They, uh, they're, they're addicted to it with somebody, without somebody, it doesn't make a difference. Some of them, Hashem have uh, almost lost causes. Almost, almost lost causes. But everything has a solution. Some, uh, it's just a more difficult solution. But nonetheless, everybody has a solution. It all starts with following what Torah says. So Torah says, don't only just... Follow, don't just uh, avoid following your heart and the desires of your heart, but also your eyes too. Don't follow your eyes. Don't look at a place that you're not supposed to look at. If you watch your eyes, your life will change drastically. Because now you're turning your eyes into a Kli Kodesh, into a holy tool. If you only allow your eyes to look at things that are appropriate, you become a holy person. You become a holy person. You become a holy tool. So when you read a Torah, you're going to remember everything you read. A lot of people, they read Torah, they don't remember 95% of what they read. Why? Because their eyes are used both for good things and for bad things. So, how much poison does it take? How much percentage out of 100% if let's say I have a bottle of water? If I have 50% poison, 50% water, is it good water or no? No good, right? But if I have 40% poison, 60% water. Is it good water or no? No. What if I have 10% poison, 90% water? Is it good? No. What if I have only 1% poison, 99% good water? Still no. But it's 99. Still no good. Right? That's the key. You see, you have to understand. The Satan doesn't require you to become Hitler overnight. All he wants is for you to make a sin that's small enough where you don't even think it's a sin. It's not a big deal. Let me post an immodest picture on Facebook because, eh, who's looking anyway? Let me just look at this webpage even though really I'm not supposed to. Let me watch this movie or this commercial for five minutes. Let me do this. Let me. He gets you with something small. Once he gets you with something small, then that threshold changes. Now, that something small all of a sudden becomes permissible. So the next time you ask for something small, it's not the same thing anymore. You ask for something else that's small, but that's automatically much bigger than the first one. So first he says, just look at her. Oh, you looked at her? It's okay now to look? Okay, next thing you know, he's like, oh, give her a hug. She's nice, she's kind. Why don't you give her a hug? Next thing you know, why don't you guys go on a date? No touch, just go on dates. Be boyfriend, girlfriend, but don't touch. Next thing you know, it's this. Just this weekend, I was walking with my kids to... I mean, they were more or less religious kids and teenagers, 16, 17, 18 years old, both wearing a kippah, and they're socializing. 
Now, if I if I didn't have eyes, I was sure the two kids from public school that most likely not even Jewish. The conversation they were having about girls, no, uh, she's not my type. No, she's my type. No, I'm gonna go out with. Her. I'm gonna try this one out. They start the way they, these two religious kids are talking. I was sure I was back in high school, Port Richmond High School, with all the goyim. But these are two religious kids. Why? They didn't start that way. They didn't start that way. They didn't start thinking that it was okay to go out with girls and try things out like the non-Jewish world, like the secular world. They didn't think that way. They started by, oh, it's okay to look. Oh, my, nobody said anything about not looking. Okay, so let me uh, touch. Oh, wow, when I, when I brought my friend, my girlfriend to the house, my parents said, oh, wow, how cute. You guys are like a little boyfriend, girlfriend. Wow, that's so cute. Oh, they even thought it was cute. They got complimented for it. Next thing you know, it's like, yeah, she's not my type. She's not my type. They're talking like uh, grown-ups. Talking like grown-ups. So what? It started one, two, three. Satan has the whole equation. And that's why, unfortunately, many of these so-called religious kids uh, are uh, acting no different than the goyim, just with a keep on. Just with a keep on. It is partly their fault, but it's more the fault of their parents for not saying anything. And it's also the fault of the rabbis and the teachers of the, of the, of the communities for not speaking out about this. Uh, for whatever reason or another, people think that uh, talking about what I'm talking to you is not age appropriate. Somebody told me just last week, yeah, you talk about this stuff to, to young people, it's not appropriate for young people. What do you want me to wait for until you guys are 35 and, uh, and, and uh, ruined your lives already? This, by the way, according to the Chachamim, Rabbi Aaron Rata, Rabbi Vadia, all the Chachamim, all the Tzadikim, they would start talking about this stuff, including wasting seed at the age of five. Even before age of chinuch. At five years old, they already start talking about what I'm talking to you today about. And you guys are not five years old, Baruch Hashem. Yes? A person could do Shemirat and all he wants and protect himself, and, but especially like somewhere like here in Miami, everywhere, it, everywhere you go, you're going to see things pop up. You don't have to, you don't have to try to look in your face. So there will be something there wherever you go. So Ken. How, is that, how are you supposed to prevent yourself from that? Uh, you're right. Anywhere you go, it's not just Miami. Even if you go to New York during the winter, you'll find naked women. There's naked women all the time. There's immodesty all the time. There is garbage all the time. There are sins all the time. There's, it's, it's not, there's no way to eliminate the people from sinning. No way. What you can do is eliminate your sinning. How? Uh, now, immodesty, unfortunately, has always been here. And Chadash Tachat Hashemesh. There's nothing new under the sun. It was around during the time of Isaiah the prophet where he talks to the women that are walking around with big heels and uh, short skirts in those times. Uh, and the same thing is today, 3,000 years later. The point being is that you can't stop them, but you can stop yourself. How? By limiting where you allow yourself. Limiting where you allow your eyes to go. Not only looking, where you place yourself. Now, I can tell you myself, I don't go anywhere. I come here, I'm in my house. Here, my house. Here, my house. Once in a blue moon I get punished, I have to go to the supermarket. Other than that, I'm here at the house. Now I know you guys are young, you still need to do stuff in the world and so on, but this gives you some type of a uh, understanding of how to try to preserve yourself. Limit your destinations. Malls, Beaches, movies, all of these places, you have to literally delete them from the list. Places where there's like public, a lot of people, delete them from the list. If you want to watch your eyes. You don't want to watch your eyes, then delete everything I'm saying. You want to watch your eyes, you have to pretty much reserve yourself to only go to a place that there's a point to go. So you're going to go to, let's say, uh, learn. Okay, you go to your house, straight to go learn. Pray, straight to go pray. Store, you go to the store, get your stuff, leave. Uh, you, uh, I don't know, you want to do uh, something for fun or you, know, you guys are still young and you want to have fun sometimes, make sure it's kosher fun. If that kosher fun is surrounded by non-kosher things, you can go. So for example, if your cousin, your uncle, your brother, your whoever invites you to a wedding with mixed dancing, guess what? You can't go. Why? Because over there, there's the people and there's also the shadim that they're creating. The demons that they're creating. You don't want to go to a place like that. Why? It's going to lead you to a lot of pro uh, problems. And it's going to lead you to sin also. So you have to allow yourself to certain places. And you have to be strict with yourself if you want to be strict to the extent where you're not going to sin. Now, some people are going to say, no, that's fanatic, that's crazy. But that's what Torah says. That's what Torah says. 
The Sefer Hasidim says that people that uh, have these or go to these uh, weddings or parties with mixed dancing, they have no idea how many Shadim, how many demons they're bringing back home with them. Because that's what's created in those places. So, if a person wants to have a good time, there's a way to have a good time in a kosher way. If a person wants to just do whatever they want and hope for the best, then, you know, suit yourself. It's just that you have to limit, limit your destinations. You have to just literally restrict yourself and be very disciplined with yourself and make sure that wherever you go, there is some point of being there. Some point, not just some point, oh, listen, I want to have uh, food. You can eat at home also. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it has to be like some type of uh, thought process that goes behind where am I going to go and why am I going to go there and what's the consequences of going there? What's the risk of me going to this place? And that's why you'll see many times the tzaddikim, you hear Sipuet tzaddikim, many times the stories, uh, most of the time the stories are either in the Bet Midrash or in their house. Bet Midrash or in their house. Why? They didn't go anywhere else. They, usually they wouldn't go anywhere else. Why? Because everywhere else there's problems. There's problems. Some of the tzaddik, there was actually one tzaddik, I forget the name, he actually uh, had a Rav, I think it was Rav Godinsky, came to visit him one time. He was a Gdola Dor, and they asked, where does he live? He came to visit him, and he saw when he got to his house, he knocked on the door, and it took almost 15 minutes to open the door. He says, what happened? And then he opened the door, and he sees all these huge sacks of sand. He goes, why did it take you 15 minutes to open the door, and what are these sacks? We have a war. He says, well, listen, the Rambam says, if you are surrounded by Rishayim, you have to move. But if you can't move, move to the desert. It doesn't literally mean move to the actual desert itself. Make your life into like a desert where you're separated from the world. So what do I do for myself? I put a restriction on myself. I put these sacks in front of my door. So by the time, if I want to go somewhere, I go to the door. By the time I remove all these sacks, it takes me 15 minutes and a lot of hard work. By the time I removed all the sacks, I realized, do I really need to go or not? I think twice before I go anywhere. Why? Do I really need to go? Now, if you have a job, you have to go to your job. But if you have a job that's constantly involved with immodesty, then you have to think about whether you want this job or not. That's why I feel bad a lot for, for, for people that are constantly meeting uh, customers. Because, unfortunately, uh, that's, that's beyond your control. If you could have a job that's predominantly behind a desk in an office, and you don't have to meet many people, that's ideal. But either way, the point being is to have some type of thought process behind every decision that you make. Before you go somewhere, think about what's going to happen as a result of it, and that's going to help you a lot. Yes? Hashem created such a beautiful world. Okay. Are we not supposed to go out and see it and like get pleasure from it? Uh, there's actually a Gemara that says that if you don't enjoy the world, you get punished. But uh, So yes, you are supposed to enjoy things in the world. But that does not mean that you're allowed to sin as a result of it. Meaning that, yes, you are allowed and should enjoy different parts of the world, but there is a kosher way to do everything. There is a kosher way to eat, and there's a non-kosher way to eat. Now, you can go, and you can watch the Food Channel or something, and you could see these guys cook all this pork and other non-kosher animals in such a delicious way. And you can't say, no, it's disgusting. It's not true. It's not true. It's not disgusting. Quite frankly, I don't know, I've never tasted bacon before, but people tell me it's delicious. Some people say it's the most delicious meat in the world. Rabban Gamliel says, don't say I'm not eating non-kosher because it's disgusting, because it's not true. Say I'm not eating non-kosher because my Father in Heaven said don't. That's why. So, that looks delicious, but you know you can't have it. So what do you do? You can make something similar. You can make turkey bacon. That's kosher turkey. Turkey bacon, or soy, or so on and so forth. So you could have the same flavor, just in a kosher way. There's also a fish called shibuta. They have it in Africa. Also tastes like bacon. There's also a duck in Japan. Also tastes like bacon. Point being is that if somebody is craving bacon, they could find a kosher way to have it. Same thing with anything else. You want to go see the mountains? There's a kosher way to go see the mountains. Go to the place where it's not full of people. That's uh, you're gonna know. It's, it's this place is the tourist attraction number one. Pretty much people go there, but they forget all their clothes in the camp. Don't go there. Go to the place. You could still see the mountain. Baruch Hashem, it's a very big mountain. Just from a different angle. Where those, it's not the number one tourist attraction in the world. It's a different angle that's not full of them. Same thing. So you could do a lot of things in a wonderful way. You want to see the ocean? You could see the ocean. Just don't go to the beach. 
where there's all these people. You understand? So there are wonderful things in the world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. You can go see them, you can go enjoy them, there's no problem. It's just that you have to find a kosher way to do everything. If you do that, you'll have a kosher life, you'll have a blessed life, and you'll have a life that's worth living. But when a person doesn't, then they simply get themselves used to satisfying themselves and every desire they have, and little by little, their kosher becomes safik, like a doubtful, sometimes kosher, sometimes not, depends who's looking, depends who's the rabbi. You know, then it's sometimes not kosher at all, but who's looking, then it's just not kosher. And next thing you know, before they know it, they find themselves in a place where I can't believe what happened to my life in a few months. It's upside down, like the kid told me a few days ago. In a sense, so you have to take care of your neshama. You only get one. Take care of it. And uh, I promise you, you'll have a much, much better life than all of the other people that you may or may not know that are satisfying every one of their pleasures. Because all of those people that are satisfying their pleasures, little by little they become desensitized to the point where even satisfying their pleasures is unsatisfying to them. So they start looking at things that are more exotic, more taboo, more extraordinary, and uh, they destroy themselves because they become numb as a result of satisfying every urge. Yes? Um, so you, you talk about a lot of things that people do. And they get punished, right? They go to Gehenim for... Okay, so... Doesn't Hashem have mercy? Of course. For people who... They fell into something that they, they didn't know what they, what they were getting into. Like, they just got into it. Yes. Uh, from other people's fault. Yes. They never able to get out. Yes. And then they, they pass away then. What happens? Hashem doesn't... No, so... Ha- well, of course, of course. Hashem takes everything into account. The beautiful thing about Hashem is that He is the humblest, the most merciful, but he also is the one that gets the least amount of credit. He does everything and anything to help us, satisfy us, nurture us, but we always view him in the wrong perspective. When we don't see his hand, we think that he's not helping us at all. Little do we know he's the one carrying us. You know, like the famous story where there was a guy that uh, believed that he was, uh, you know, dreaming. Every day he saw footsteps in the, on the beach. Two sets of footsteps. He was going to a good time, and he saw two foot of footsteps, and he told people, yeah, listen, that's me. One set of footsteps is me, the other set of footsteps is Hashem. He's walking with me because I'm succeeding, and I know it's only because of Hashem. Before he knew it, life happened, and his life turned upside down. And he stepped, he had the same dream, but this time, he only had one set of footsteps. And he said, you know, Ribbono Shalom, I don't understand. When everything was going good, I was dreaming about you, you were with me in a dream, we were walking next to each other, I prayed to you every day with Kavanah, I gave Tzedaka, I did this, I did that, and every night I would dream about you, Hashem, you were walking next to me. All of a sudden I'm having a tough time and you left me. Now since it's a story, we're allowed to say that Hashem spoke to him. Hashem speaks to the man and he says, no, no, my son, your mistake is you think that I left you. What you don't realize is that since your problem started, I've been carrying you. That's why you only see one set of footsteps. It's my footsteps. So we don't give Hashem the right credit because we always judge Him incorrectly with no kafschut. So that also applies to the famous question that people say, well, what if somebody was not born in a religious family? What if somebody got into, like you said, an issue he didn't even realize is an issue? Well. Why are we assuming that that person died that way? Why are we assuming that that person that was born into a non-religious family died without knowing about religion? He lived 70, 80, 90 years. And of course, at some point during those 70, 80, 90 years, Hashem showed him religion, showed him the Torah, sent him a Chabadnik, sent him a breast liver, sent him a crazy guy named Yaron from New York, sent him a CD, sent him an app, sent him a video, he sent them signs countless times regardless of what corner in the world he's in. He sent them those times. If he still died secular, as you know, after seeing all of those signs, then it's not Hashem's fault. He chose otherwise. He chose not to be religious. He was given the opportunity. Same thing with somebody that made a mistake, got into the wrong business, got into the wrong sin, got into the wrong addiction, didn't realize it was that bad until Rabbi Reuben told him, listen, you need to get home. Ha, ha. Okay, but now you heard it. Did you die? No, you just got scared to death, but you didn't die. 
That means that a Kadosh Baruch Hu sent this crazy guy from New York all the way here for you to hear it because he's planning on giving you another 70, 80, 90 years of this world. Only now you can do tshuva. So now when we compare it in Shemaim, you live 20 years with 5 years of sin. But 70 years, no sin. 70 years, no sin. Why? Because you listen to the shiul, you did tshuva, you stop sinning. So in Shemaim they say, it's like this guy never sinned before. Yeah, he sinned for 5 years, and he didn't know, and he did this, and he did it. Right, but then he did tshuva. And Hashem gave him another 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, 80, 90 years in this world. By the time he gets to Shemaim, the sin is like, a, it's not even a memory. He did so much tshuva for that sin, he's actually turned the sin into a mitzvah. If you really do serious, serious tshuva, the highest level of tshuva, you can actually turn all of your sins into mitzvot. To that extent. So, again, we always assume that Hashem showed a person, oh, here is the uh, sign, do not enter, and then He kills him right away. No, no, He doesn't kill him. He shows him a warning, and then another warning, and then another warning, and He gives him many, many signs, do not enter, do not enter, do not enter, do not enter, and along the way, those signs get stronger and more obvious. If the person still chooses, then obviously it's a clear choice. It's not a choice out of ignorance, it's a choice out of choice. And that's what we don't take into account, because we think that Hashem just brought us into the world to punish us. This is why when a person finishes their time in this world and they get to heaven, the Chachamim say the most embarrassing thing that a person will ever experience is their judgment in heaven. And the reason why is because they're shown all of the choices they made out of their own free will, meaning they wanted to make this choice, they wanted to have this abortion, they wanted to commit this murder, they wanted to enjoy the stealing, they wanted to go and violate Shabbat, they wanted it. It's not that they didn't know and there was some uh, you know, innocent lamb in the middle of the field that some wolf uh, jumped on. No, no, no. They wanted, they enjoyed it, they liked it, and they knew it. And when Hashem shows them the consequences of all of their actions in this world, and how He felt, and how what they did, guess what? The Neshama asks Hashem, Hashem, I'm so embarrassed, please put me in Genom. The Neshama asks to be in Genom. Not Hashem says, you go to Genom. No, no. The Neshama is so embarrassed of how awful it did, and how much Hashem gave him help, and how many opportunities He gave him. The Neshama says, no, 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 Hashem, Hashem, it's not right. Put me in Genom. That's the only thing I deserve. It's the only thing I deserve. And the Shema is not suicidal. It's just that the Shema is embarrassed out of the choices that I made. So yes, all of us have some mistakes that we've made in our life, but that's the point of the Yishurim. The point of the Yishurim is to realize, yes, I'm making a mistake. Yes, to fix this mistake is going to take a little bit of effort or a lot of bit of effort, and it's not going to be easy. I'm already addicted. I'm already this. I'm already that. Get it. Hashem knows. But that's why the Mishnah in Avot says, Ezeu Gibo, who's a Gibo? Who's a hero? Who's a hero? Wait, you think somebody lifts 800 pounds a hero? No. Who's a hero? Amit Gaber Al Someone that overcomes his evil inclination. Someone that wants to do something, has a desire to do something, it looks delicious, it looks flavorful, it looks like fun, and guess what? It is fun. But he knows Hashem doesn't want it, and he doesn't do it. It's not that he says, no, no, I don't want to be with her because it's not fun. It's not true. You're a liar. It is going to be fun, but it's a sin. It's fun, but it's not allowed. The bacon is delicious, but it's not allowed. You understand? So that's a gibo. Gibol is someone that overcomes something delicious. Not someone that says, oh, it smells bad anyway. Who wants it? Oh, she's ugly anyway. Who wants it? Oh, he has only one arm and one leg. Who's a, who wants this guy? No! What, do you think he get rewarded for going overcoming that? A monkey can overcome it. A monkey doesn't even want to be with her. No! It's something that's delicious. That you want it. And then you say, no, no. But my father in heaven said no. My father in heaven said no. Then no. I want it. But that's the, that's the key. That's what makes me a gibo. That's what makes me a hero. I want to yell at her, 
But I'm not allowed to yell at her. Why? Because Hashem says, don't yell at your wife. Well, for those crazy people that are watching still online and they hit their wives, I have a few people that tell me, a few women tell me that their, uh, their husbands hit them. Religious. Religious husbands from, from birth hit their wives because, uh, I don't know, something went wrong in the yeshiva or something. They, tell you, they forgot to teach me how to hit your wife. According to Allah, if the Sanhedrin was here, you cut their hands. You're allowed to cut their hands, chop their hands. The Chachamim are allowed to cut their hands from men that hit their wives. In today's world, you can't cut anybody's hands, we have to put them on cheren. I want to hit her. She deserves the hit. I'm not allowed to hit. Why? Hashem said no. Hashem said no. Point being, Rabotai, is that the sins are always delicious. The sins always look good, always look like fun. But that's why you get rewarded for overcoming them. And Hashem will give you one opportunity, another opportunity, another opportunity. And if you take Him and His Torah seriously, you can live a life that's worth living, that's magical. Because you're going to feel like a hero constantly. Because your Yetzirah is going to come to you 24 hours a day. It's never going to stop. If it's not this, it's something else. Not this, something else. Something else. It's constantly, it's constantly. You overcome your Yetzirah, at the end of the day, you're like, I'm so tired, but I'm a superhero. Why? I didn't fall for the Yetzirah today. I didn't fall for the Yetzirah today. I, I don't, listen, I had a lot of opportunities. I could have looked at this. I could have done this. I could have taken this. I could have done... By the end of the day, if you're not tired, there's something wrong. Something wrong. Why? If you're not tired, that means you probably fell for a few sins. If you're tired at the end of the day from fighting the Yetzirah, that means you're good. Why? Because the Yetzirah doesn't leave you. If it's not this, if it's not this, if it's I'm angry, so I want to yell. If I'm not angry, I want this. Uh, stingy, angry, arrogant. A million and a half different reasons. Oh, I really want to embarrass him because he deserves to be embarrassed. Well, yeah, but the Torah says you embarrass somebody in public, it's like you murder them. Sometimes, for example, wives think that it's a, it's a mitzvah to embarrass their husbands in public. I don't know why. I don't know. Somehow it's this, this like, there's like a defect. There's like a defect in, in this generation that, you know, people think that it's okay to embarrass each other. Not only embarrass them, but embarrass them in public. Oh, don't look at my husband like they come to me. Don't look at my husband like he's a tzaddik. You know what he does? And they start telling me everything that he does in front of him, the poor guy. And there's other people. Now, if it's just us and there's a marriage counseling or something, okay, fine. But oh, she decides to give the whole shoe, the whole cheshbon in front of everybody. Imagine, I'm at a lecture at different places. There's 50, 60 people at the end of the lecture. They have questions. And then his wife, she decides to tell me every little embarrassing detail about a husband. Oh, don't look at the Mekid Sadiq with this keeper. No, no. Last week, and uh, I want to die for him. I want to die for the guy. You're guaranteed not to go in home. Go to Gainom, the guy. Why? A wife like this, you're living in Gainom. A wife like this, you're living in Gainom. But that's it, Rabotai. You're not allowed to embarrass each other. You're not allowed to yell at people. You're not allowed to do all of these different things because it's not good for you. Even though sometimes it seems like it's the right thing to do, it's appropriate thing to do. No, I'm just educating her. No, I'm just disciplining him. No, no, my friend. There's a way and there's a way. If you do it the right way, you'll live a life full of blessings. You do it the wrong way, your life will be simply cursed. This is what you don't want. So yes, it's hard, but that's what you get rewarded for it. Yes? Is the reason why you do the Bitahon series and the Get Har Mam like again each week and every week so that we understand the consequences of like for example sinning and our actions? Because I understand like from a lot of your shiurim, you say like um, you discuss similar um, topics, just give different examples. Okay. So is that why? Well, Torah itself in general, it falls into two, two basics that uh, the entire Torah can fall into. There's allowed, there's not allowed. There's reward, there's punishment. That's in essence for all of history until about 300 years ago. All lectures from the Moshe Rabbeinu all the way till about 300 years ago, all lectures were based on reward and punishment. You do this, you get rewarded. You do this, you get punished. But obviously, they would have different ways of achieve, of, of getting you to that point. They'll talk to you about the Ramban, they'll talk to you about Alakha, they'll talk to you about different things. But in essence, the basis of structure of all lectures was this you get rewarded, this you get punished. In the last 300 years, since the what's called the Enlightenment movement, 
of uh, Mendelssohn and the reform and the conservative which eventually culminated with not only the reform and conservative movements but also with modern orthodoxy they call it an open orthodoxy and all these different types of versions of orthodox Judaism that little by little have made the sins look like mitzvot and the reason why is because little by little everyone wanted to become more and more politically correct so Mendelssohn almost 300 years ago said be a Jew at home be a human being outside that's the problem a Jew has to be a Jew all the time. So he wanted to be politically correct. Today, people don't like to talk about specific things because they're, they're, uh, they don't want to hurt other people's feelings. Oh, maybe if I talk that, you know, say that homosexuality is forbidden. In the Torah, some homosexual will be offended. I don't care if he's offended. I care that it's not allowed. Now, I don't want to offend him. My goal is not to offend him or her. But my, my goal is to not offend Hashem. That's my goal. My goal is not to offend Hashem, is to make sure that everybody knows homosexuality is not allowed. And Hashem considers it disgusting, and so on and so forth. So, now, if he gets offended, or if his mom gets offended because she thinks it's cute that he's homosexual, then that's not my problem. They're being offended by, you know, by something that they shouldn't, be, shouldn't even be doing in the first place. So, my goal is to do what our forefathers have done for all of history, which is in essence to use every body of Torah, whether it's the Geret Ramban or Bitachon or the Pirkei Avot that we did for the last couple of years or everything else to always arrive at the same conclusion which is through this work we also learn that there is reward and then there is punishment. Once you know that there is reward and there is punishment and you could apply it to every single thing that's in the Torah and you could see that they themselves all, we, all the Chachamim wrote everything with that as their, as, as their focal point then you realize that's the Torah. Your whole life is supposed to be based on allowed, not allowed, allowed, not allowed. Now, once you have that, once you have that basic foundation, then you can build a lot of beautiful things on that. Then the bitachon will work, then the emuna will work, then the irat shamayim, all of the other things that we want people to have, all these different character traits, all of these different uh, positive things, then all of those things will work. But so long as you don't know the difference between right and wrong, then whatever you build on it is going to be rotten. Meaning that if you have the wrong foundation, no matter how beautiful the building is, it will eventually collapse because the foundation is rotten. So it could be a Trump Tower or somebody else's tower and it could have all made out of glass, made out of stone, made out of whatever. But if the foundation is rotten, then it's not going to last. One storm and it topples over. If the learning that you have, the Torah teachings that you have, are not based off of the foundation of reward and punishment, it's only a matter of time before it topples over. It's only a matter of time before somebody finds a way to negate everything you just said. And that's what's happened. Over the last 300 years, more and more people have tried to become more politically correct in order to get fans, in order to become more popular, and they forgot the mission. So you'll see there are certain people that have a million views on their uh, YouTube. They have a million views. But anyone that knows a little bit of Gemara, a little bit of Torah, watches that video and says, he's a rabbi? He's Jewish? He's, that's what he's, he's actually claiming to represent Judaism. What he says, for, he has a million views. But what he says is not Torah. He says things that sound good to the ear, but they don't sound according to not good to Hashem. And that's the thing. So there are some people that do that because they want fans. Because fans bring money. I'm not looking for fans. I'm looking to help Jews become more Jews. Money, Hashem will send one way or another. You know, that's, 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 that's the key. So it's, it's, a, it's a big test because you're in, in, the, in the world today, it's, it's rare. It's especially in the English-speaking world. There are very, very few people that you will find that speak about reward and punishment, speak about genome, speak about wasting seeds, speak about pretty much everything we spoke about tonight at all, ever in their life. Sometimes they even go against people like me. Well, they, uh, some some uh, guy that claims to be religious just last week sent me an email says that no, I think that what you're teaching is not age appropriate. I said, what am I teaching? He says, oh, you're teaching about the things of Kedusha, meaning about wasting seed and things of that nature. I said, if it's not allowed to teach this, 
then how come every Jew is obligated to learn about at least a couple times a year in the parashot? Parashat Kedoshim, Parashat Kitavo, there are several parashot in the Torah that specifically talk about this. The, Noah's, the second parasha in uh, Noah. Noah, why was the Mabul? The Mabul came because of wasting seed. So how come Hashem said it's an obligation for a five-year-old to learn about this? But what I'm saying is not age appropriate. When do you want me to wait? For them to be 30 years old and all ruin their life? Oh, but it's near, you know, it's eh, eh. Maybe you should teach it one-on-one. Yeah, one-on-one. By the time you finish, uh, Mashiach is going to come ten times. She's not going to have anybody to save. So the point is that people are so uncomfortable with, uh, with this uh, topic, not because it's an inappropriate topic, but rather because they've never heard anybody else talk about it. It's gone to that point. But if you look at the books, there's the holy books from just the previous generation. You see that there's countless books written about it. There's countless chachamim that talked about it. There's countless material about it. It's just that today, it's become almost like a uh, taboo to talk about punishment at all. Even when I say something simple, like for example, that according to the Torah in 12 places, someone that drives on Shabbat is considered an idol worshiper in the eyes of Hashem. This is written 12 times in the Torah. Not once, not twice, 12 times. It's the most frequently mentioned sin in the Torah is Chilul Shabbat. So when you mention this, it doesn't sound nice. Why? Because the guy thinks of himself as Jewish, he goes to Big Knesset, he just drives. He doesn't think his driving is a big deal. I went to Boca Raton Synagogue for a couple of years when I first moved to Florida. They have a whole parking lot, a whole parking lot, just for their Mechalel Shabbat to drive in and drive out of. And no one says a single thing. They have a whole parking lot. They're not even, they're not, they refuse to sell the parking Somebody wanted to buy the parking lot just to stop people from sinning. They don't want to sell it. No, this is for our members. <laughs> so they're, they're helping people sin. And this is big synagogue, a thousand families. The, the rabbi over there, Goldberg, he's one of the head dayanim in Florida. It's not like uh, some nobody, nobody knows who he is. This is one of the most famous people in, in, in American Judaism. Now, it's not the Shonara, you can tell you this is, all, this is all public information. Now, the problem is that when I say something like a Michalel Shabbat, as death penalty in heaven, uh, idol worshipping, and so on and so forth, which is what it says in the Torah. People say, no, that's not nice to say. It's very uh, degrading. It's very insulting. To who? Who is this insulting to? To the Mechalel Shabbat? Good, so maybe hopefully he stops. Hopefully he stops it. Hopefully he gets insulted, realizes, oh, wait a minute, I'm insulted. I want to check if this guy's right. And he checks, and he sees, oh, it's right. Oh, it says he's right again, he's right again, 12 times he's right, and the Shulchan Aruch 7 times, and the Gemara 50 times, and so on and so forth. Hashem said it, not Yaron Ruven. Yaron just repeated it. I'm like a parrot. You can't blame the mailman for your mail. All I did is I repeated it. So, if you're offended by what God said, then I, I can't help you. You have to find, I don't know, find a, find a different religion or something. But if you realize that this, I'm only, all I'm doing is just repeating what God said, what the Chachamim said, in the name of God, there's nothing to be offended. Whether you're ready to take it on or not, that's your business. All we are is here to publicize the information in order to make sure that everybody knows there is right and there is wrong in the eyes of Hashem. And the eyes of Hashem don't always necessarily agree with our eyes. We sometimes think that something is right when Hashem says it's wrong. We sometimes think that something is wrong when in the eyes of Hashem it's right. For example, is there any, any way that any one of you can think that killing a baby is a good thing? Can you f- just think for a second of any equation that you can say that, you know what, killing this baby would be a good thing for the world. You can't think of it, right? Because you're relatively normal people. Now what if I told you that Adolf Hitler was also a baby? And before he became Adolf Hitler, he was just Adolf, the little cute little baby. Because all babies are cute, even if they're ugly, they're still cute. Because they're little, thank God they're cute so you don't kill them. Because they cry all the time. But they're cute. So he was cute, and he was a baby, and he got sick. So his mom, Mrs. Adolf, she took him to a Jewish doctor. And the Jewish doctor, last minute, saved his life. Now if you were the doctor, you were the doctor, any of you were the doctor, thank you, this gave me this one. If any of you were the doctor, and you saw a baby, and you have a chance to kill it, would you kill it? No, right? Now what if I told you, this baby is going to become Adolf Hitler, is going to kill six million of your brothers and sisters, including you. 
would you kill it? Yes. No. You kill it, right? You kill it? You're still not going to kill it? You're going to let him kill six million people? Change, maybe you no changing. I'm telling you, he's definitely killing. No changing. He's killing. He's uh, he's got the knife already in his pocket. We're we're playing hypothetical, guys. Play along with me. Don't make a new equation. This is my comic book, not yours. <laughs> this kid is gonna kill. You're gonna kill him or not? Yeah. You're gonna kill him. You're ever gonna kill him. You're all normal. Mendy, you with me? Can't you can't kill the kid, but he's gonna kill six million people. Yeah, that's that's like that's God. Mendy knows a little Torah, so he gave us a Torah answer. Now, okay. Logically, we could say it's right. Logically, we could say it's wrong. You can fight for both sides. The Torah says otherwise. The Torah says that at the time of Mitzrayim, Moshe Rabbeinu saw that one of the most evil things that the Nazis even outdid, the, the Egyptians even outdid the Nazis, was with what they did to babies. Paro had sarat, he had a skin disease, so his necromancers told him that in order for him to get cured, he had to bathe in the blood of 150 babies in the morning and 150 babies at night. So every day, they'd kill 300 Jewish babies. If that wasn't enough, these evil Egyptians would force the Jews to meet a certain quota of how many rocks, how many bricks they made. And if the guy didn't, if the Jew did not meet, that Israelite did not meet the quota, instead of putting the brick in the wall, they put the baby in the wall alive. Now Moshe Rabbeinu saw this. He saw the little babies, little Israelite babies, going inside a wall. I mean, it's just think about it, you want to die. Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to die. He couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. And he said, Ribbono shel olam. I know you know, I know everything, but please, please, Hashem, let me save this baby. What did the baby do? What did the baby do? He says, Moshe, you get upset at him. You question why I do what I do. These are evil neshamot. But if you want to save one, save one. Moshe Rabbeinu, at the moment of passion that he wanted to do the good thing, guess what? He saved the baby. He took a baby. He was already inside the wall. He took the baby, saved the baby. And he named the baby Micha. After what was supposed to happen to him, which is Limoach. We were supposed to get crushed, this baby, by the stones. So he saved them right before they crushed him. Now from that moment on, that baby grew up and followed Moshe Rabbeinu everywhere. Now what did Hashem say? These are evil neshamot. What did the baby look like? Cute neshama. Cute little kid, right? And the kid... Learns, Aleph Bet, Shema Yisrael, oh, he's cute. Well, as you would have it, we go to Egypt, fast forward to the Ten Plagues, fast forward we go to Mount Sinai, fast forward, we get the first two commandments. Am Yisrael says, Moshe Rabbeinu, listen, every time Hashem talks, we die. Hashem said the first commandment, all of Am Yisrael died. Hashem re resurrected them, brought them back to life. Said the second commandment, they couldn't handle it, they died. Literally died. Hashem resurrected them. Then Am Yisrael says to Moshe Rabbeinu, you, know, you go talk to him, lest we die. If, because if he talks again, we're going to die again. You go talk to him, we're going to do, and then we'll listen. Meaning, you go talk to him, then come back to us, tell us what to do, and then we'll, uh, we'll figure things out. But we can't hear his voice anymore, right? Every time Hashem talks, it's so holy, we can't handle it. Our neshama leaves our body. Gemara says that every time he would talk, the neshama would leave the body, and then Hashem would send a special, beautiful smelling dew that would bring back their neshama into their body. Something beautiful. Gemara Masechet Shabbat. Anyway, now, Moshe Rabbeinu goes to Mount Sinai. He says to Am Yisrael, I'm going there for 40 days, 40 nights. Am Yisrael miscalculates. Am Yisrael miscalculates by six hours. Six hours, they think that Moshe Rabbeinu is supposed to come back at 12, and he comes back at 6. Now during those 12, 6 hours, to them it's like a lifetime. He's been, he's been gone for, for 40 days. They think that he's supposed to come. So now, since they have doubt, the Satan comes. Anytime you have doubt in Hashem, you're giving an opening to the Satan. Satan comes, he goes, oh, yeah, Moshe Rabbeinu is not here. You know why, right? He died. Wow, Moshe Rabbeinu died? Yeah, he died. He shows him some fake movie of how there's some, uh, somebody being carried by the angels and so on and so forth. So they think, oh, I can't believe it. He died. Listen, 
we need a new middleman. We need somebody to connect us to Hashem. So they come to her. They hear her. Listen, make us uh, something. Make us a statue. Her says, are you crazy? No. I'm not making anything. It's a soul. They kill him. They kill him. They kill her. Why? He says, what? You're not willing to, uh, to, for us, to, to help us serve Hashem? You're not worth to uh, be alive. They go to Aaron. Aaron, help us out. Make us something. So Aaron knew they're so passionate. They're so into the mitzvah. They're so into tshuva. They're so into everything. They're not even seeing straight. So he said, you know what? Let me just buy time. Let me just buy time. What's the most difficult thing you could ask from people? Their money. Their money. You ask them to, to go climb a mountain, they'll climb a mountain. You ask them go, you know, run 19 miles for me so somebody could donate $10, they'll run 19 miles. Say, can you donate $10? No, 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 I can't donate. That's too much. 19 miles, they can run. Donate $10, they can't. So, Aaron knew this. He says, listen, guys, why don't you guys give me all your gold? He figured it's going to take a while for them to get all the gold. They get arguing about money and so on and so forth. But to his surprise, the Yetzirah was already running wild. The guy started taking off all their bracelets, all their earrings, all their everything. And they're throwing the, all the gold at Aaron. Now Aaron says, okay, fine. I wasn't expecting to get all this money right away, all this gold right away. But I'm still okay. Why? If you take all this gold, I have to melt it. To melt gold, anybody that knows a little bit about jewelry business, it takes a lot. A lot of very, very hot fire, first of all. And second of all, a lot of time to melt the gold, to turn it into the little lava that it looks like, and so on. So he says, okay, okay, guys, listen. Throw all the gold into the fire. He's thinking that by the time this gold is going to melt, it's going to be a few days. So he's not worried. He knows that Moshe Rabbeinu is coming in a few hours. He's not worried. But to his surprise, little Micha, the kid, the kid comes. The kid comes and he has something in his hand that belonged to Moshe Rabbeinu. What's in his hand? Before Am Yisrael left Egypt, they had to deliver on a promise that Am Yisrael, that the 12 tribes made to their brother Yosef. Yosef said to the brothers, listen, when you leave Egypt, you have to promise me that if I die before all of you, that you're going to take my bones to Eretz Israel. Take my tomb to Eretz Israel. You have to promise me. And everybody promised. So Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to deliver on that promise that his forefathers made, that the Levi made, to take uh, Yosef out of Egypt. Problem is that he didn't know where he was. Because the Egyptians worshipped Yosef at Tzadik. And they hid his body. They hid his tomb. So he had to find somebody that actually knew where Yosef at Tzadik was, was actually buried. There was only one person that knew where that was, and that was a woman by the name of Serach. Serach, the daughter of Asher. And the only reason she knew is because she was alive at the time of Yosef at Tzadik. She was blessed by her, her uh, grandfather Yaakov that she's going to live forever until she goes to uh, heaven. So she was already hundreds and hundreds of years old, and she was there, and she saw and knew exactly where Yosef HaTzadik was actually buried. And she told Moshe Rabbeinu, he's buried inside the Nile River. The Egyptians hid his tomb inside the Nile River. So, yes, so Moshe Rabbeinu comes to the Nile River. He doesn't have cranes like we have today. He doesn't have all that stuff. All he has, he has Hashem. It's more than enough. So he says, okay, the tomb is here. We have to deliver on a promise. He takes a mate, which is like a piece of metal. On one side he engraves the name of Hashem, the holy name of Hashem. On the other side of it, he engraves Ale Shor Ale, Rise, Bull, Rise. Because each one of the tribes had a symbol. Yehuda had a symbol of lion. Yosef had a symbol of bull. So he says, Rise, Bull, Rise. And before he threw it, he spoke to the neshama of Yosef, and he says, Yosef, I'm here to deliver on the promise of our forefathers. Either you take yourself out of this river, raise the tomb out of the river, or you're staying here. He threw the mate inside the water, and the kedusha from Hashem's name made the tomb come out of the water. He took the tomb and left, never thinking about what happened to this little piece of metal. Never thinking that little Micha, the boy he saved years ago, was hiding in the bushes. And as soon as he left, he jumped into the water and grabbed this little mate, grabbed this piece of metal, and he held it. 
Now what happens? You fast forward to the point of the story that I just mentioned. All of the Jews are throwing their gold into the fire and little Micha doesn't have anything. He doesn't have any gold, but he has this little piece of metal. So he throws the piece of metal. What does the metal say? Rise, bowl, rise. What comes out of the fire by itself without being made? A bull. A bull comes out and from the Kedusha of Hashem's name being on that Mateh, that bull speaks. And it comes out by itself and says, I am the God that took you out of Egypt. Are we still surprised that Am Yisrael worshipped it for a little while? That the Erev Rav worshipped it? It spoke. I promise you. A bull comes to the shield and starts talking to us, there's a very good chance a few people start worshipping it. I'm done. A bull comes, there's a bull that's dead on Wall Street. I used to live on Wall Street. I used to live on Wall Street. It was 15 Wall Street, 15 Broad Street, right in the corner, across the street from the New York Stock Exchange. On top of the block, literally a minute and a half from my house, there's a huge bull. You know how many people worship it? People go there, take pictures. Oh, they put it on their walls. Everywhere. They worship this bull. This is the bull. And it's dead. If that bull started talking, more people will come. So you see, Rabotai, what did Hashem say to Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe, he told Moshe, listen, you can save the baby. You can use your free choice to save the baby. But if I'm killing a baby, there's a reason for it. Because it's not a, it's baby in body. But the neshama is not. It's an evil neshama. If I'm killing it, there's a reason for it. You don't want to trust my reason? You want to do something you think you do better? Chavod. So from here we see that anything that happens in the world that doesn't necessarily agree with our logic, doesn't necessarily make God bad, chas v'shalom, doesn't make him evil, chas v'shalom, doesn't make him wrong, chas v'shalom. It's just that we don't understand the whole picture. We just understand one part. We understand that the little girl got abused, or the little boy got this, or the little this, or all these things that are crazy happened. And yes, the people that did it are going to get punished. But nonetheless, Hashem did it. Hashem allowed it for His own reasons that are beyond our comprehension. Therefore, that when we have our desires, when we have our Yetzirah, even though sometimes it seems like it's too big for us, it's not too big for us. We just think it is. Hashem gave us a test because He knows we can pass it. He wouldn't give us a test unless He knew for sure we can pass it, no matter how hard, how hard we think it is. And that's, in essence, the whole goal of all of the lectures. It's to, number one, remind us that there's a reward for the good that we do, there's a punishment for the bad that we do. But the definition of good and bad can only be the definition that Hashem has, not our own definition. Not what we determine is good. Because what we determine as good is flawed many times. We have to look constantly at the book and see what does he say is good? What does he say is right? If he says it's good, if he says it's right, then you know for sure it's right and it's good. But if I said it, if you said it, if somebody really smart says it, 50-50. And that's what we constantly mention the sources and we use the Chachamim, whether it's the Ramban, or the Beta Levi, or the Gemara, or so on and so forth, because we know that if it was written in those books, that's the Word of God. That's the word of God. To me, to anybody that has a little bit of sechel, that's as good as it gets. That's as good as it can get. Because you know that's guaranteed. Guaranteed that even though it may not look good in the beginning, in the end it always will be. Bezat Hashem on Tuesday night will continue with the shurim. We have a, our Igeret uh, Ramban on Tuesday night. Bezat Hashem, you guys can ask some more questions. Baruch Adonai Amen.